layers. We're pretty open on here. The only thing we can't discuss today is yeah. that uh, Dan Dan recently judged a show and he yeah. can't uh, give out the information of which girl fucked him <laughs> off to win. Other than that, <laughs> anyone gets offended, they go fuck themselves. Awesome. Be as open as you want. Very good. All right, cool. I'm in your hands. I'll let you guys take over. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to Bash Bros Podcast. Uh, I don't recall what number this episode is, but this one will be a standalone episode in the same vein that Lee Priest, etc., had for themselves. So we're very lucky to be sharing a bit of time with Victor Black. Uh, I'm sure if you don't know who Victor Black is, um, you will by the end of this this uh, this podcast. Um, you love him or hate him, he's he's a man who's had a quite a big impact on the industry. So. Um, yeah, we just want to spend some time, Victor, get to know you and get to know your background and maybe prod a few questions that um, may be controversial on occasion, but um, that's kind of what we do on this podcast, to be fair. So, um, mm -hmm. but what we normally like to do is discuss, get stuck into our guests and find out a bit about their background, or what got them into the sport. Um, obviously for you, it's a quite an academic background and stuff as well. So, I mean, just give us a, a whistle stop tour really on, on you and on what got you, you to where you are, where you are now, basically. Well, firstly, thank you for the opportunity to come and, and, and speak guys. I, I very much appreciate it. As you said, I, I do consider myself to be an, ex, an extremely disruptive influence in the, in the, in the tribe. So, uh, I, I welcome the opportunity to, to speak to the, to the, to the subject matter at hand and any, any, any and all controversy that we want to talk about. So firstly, I, I might surprise you by saying, even though a lot of people think I'm an academic, I, I have no, I mean, I literally have no credentials of any description at all that fit this discussion. I am a, a weapons engineering specialist from the military. That's what my career was before I retired. I'm now 55. I, I am literally what I consider to be the voice of experience here. In other words, I'm mid fifties. I started training as a teenager, not really to get into bodybuilding. It was very much a, uh, an image enhancement strategy. I didn't like the way I looked. I was teased and bullied as a kid. And I just wanted to, I just wanted to be normal. You know, going to the gym felt like a way that I could improve my lot as it were. Um, I started competing I just, firstly, I, I trained and competed as a natural for 20 years. I wasn't particularly good, but I certainly did a large number of shows. And then approximately 20 years ago, I decided to open the door into the world of enhanced practice. And, and so really, when I come to speak, my strong card is the 40 years of experience that I bring to the table. Interestingly, I've become somewhat known as a, a, a presenter of evidence-based information that's kind of like, you know, become one of the, you know, I guess, descriptive points that people would say, he's an evidence-based educator, but I am not a PhD. I'm not a medical doctor. I literally just a bro that is also willing to roll up his sleeves and, and, and look at the clinical sports science evidence, as well as my 40 years of hand-on experience here. Yeah, that's, Did that's... you find that like your military background and stuff, because there must've been a, a lot of hoops to jump through to be that level and you must be like adapt. And, and you know you must be able to decipher information which i think is something that's like missing with a lot of people that are trying to be these kind of evidence -based I, I, what, what i would what i would argue is i have the mind of an engineer so i'm not a doctor i'm an engineer and so i tend to look at solutions to problems through a different set of filters if that makes sense yeah, yeah. so very often medical practitioners need to look at things through their ability to offer solutions to their client base i have the great luxury of not being limited by the fact that i have a a a, a framework that i have to practice medicine within so i think one of the things that helped me with my different viewpoint was simply i came to the table one as an electronics warfare specialist yeah so it's just a completely different mindset so i'm able to understand technicality I, I honestly believe what you learn when you go to university is how to learn 
I passionately believe that. Yeah. Once you've learned how to learn, you can learn anything. Yeah. And so I learned how to be an, a, a warfare officer, an electronic warfare officer. And then when I turned my attention to understanding pharmacology, I simply brought that ability to learn to the table, but I have a different set of filters. That is the mind of the engineer as opposed to the mind of the doctor or the, the mind of the research scientist. Do you or think the, that then removed or, some of the bias that you might have approached it from a, from a medical standpoint? I, I, I think people, a lot of people don't understand that when you go to medical school, for example, really what it does is it gives you a set of core competencies so that when you open this door, you should be better equipped to understand the discussion and, and, and make takeaways, but you don't learn that at medical school. If that makes sense. So, so everybody that opens this door with a singular exception of there is an individual, one individual in this tribe that has a PhD in androgen toxicity but even if you have a PhD in protein metabolism, it doesn't qualify you to speak on androgens. Yeah. But what it should do is it should give you a set of tools that allow you to better understand the data. Yeah. So what I would argue is coming in as a research scientist, coming in as a doctor and coming as an engineer, we all have to look at the same data. We all have to make our own takeaways from it, but the different skills that you bring to the table plausibly and very practically mean that you're going to walk away with different takeaways from things. I see as um, you learn all those skill sets and it all works on paper, mm. uh, like all the math add up. Um, but sometimes when you put that into the real world, it doesn't always work because uh, like there's so many different factors into every single different person. A hundred percent. You have the advantage of one, having the military background and your mindset of how you've been able to do it yourself. Secondly, we've competing so much in the naturals without using any PEDS and then switching over to understand the PEDS as well. Having so many years in the field of actually doing it, you gain that wisdom. Do you believe you got the edge over people? I, I, I would go even one step further. Yeah, sorry, I, I, sorry for cutting off. I, I would argue that I would go one step further and say, I don't think that people understand what evidence-based practice really means. So if I can for just one, what it means is, so there's three, imagine like we're creating a Venn diagram, you know, the three circles that have an intersecting point. Yeah. So one of those circles is, so what does the clinical literature or what does the sports science have to say? That's one of the circles. And then, so what does 50 years of doing tell us? And they're different discussions, but they intersect at some point and there's a crossover point. And then there's a third circle, which is client preference. And so when you get, you know, you come to the table with a certain degree of, you know, acumen as an academic or an engineer or researcher, when you get just going to the gym and getting under the bar, and the other really can only come from time working with others, because it's all well and good to say, well, this worked for me, you know, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for the next guy and the next guy and the next guy and the next guy. So in my opinion, it's where these three circles intersect that the real value is held. It's one thing to say, well, I'm a, I'm a PhD, but I, I've never taken anabolic steroids. It's like, well, you know, I'm not saying that you don't have a, a valuable voice here, but if someone has a PhD in androgen toxicity and they've used anabolic steroids, I'm more interested in what they have to say. And then if someone says, I'm a PhD with a PhD in androgen toxicity and I use anabolic steroids, and I coach bodybuilders, now you've really got my attention because you have the three triads that you can take the most powerful takeaways from. And I'm just being very honest. One of my strong cards is I, I have 40 years of doing this, Duran. That's something that you know a lot of people don't understand. They go, yeah, but he's all about the science. And I'm going, no, 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 you're missing the backstory here. I'm a bro. I'm, I'm the guy that does it that's speaking from practical experience but i care enough that i bothered to go over there and try to understand what the researchers are saying yeah so it's, 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 it's a really good point and a really really way good way of putting it with the three circles because i know so many people that they seem so knowledgeable and they they've researched it all and they have it all down on paper to back it up 
but they've never done it themselves and they don't yeah. understand what they're pushing and putting onto a, an individual as a coach to the tra- you're training somebody. Like I, I know somebody like uh, that was pushing, getting ready for a comp, they dropped the carbs really low, they're doing an hour cardio a day and he's, his metabolism was shutting down basically. Mm. And he just said, chuck in an extra hour's cardio. And the guy's like, I'm physically fucked. Okay. I can't walk, I can't talk. And he said, well, you just don't want it, do you? This guy has never competed himself. He has no idea what he's putting that guy's body through or how he feels. Mm-hmm. So I really believe you you have to have had to done it yourself to really believe the procedure. And, and, and this is where I get into I, I upset people and I you know disrupt the discussion and things like that. Let's be really honest. We are awash today with coaches that have done one show. Mm. That, that's the that's not that's the norm. I, I, one of the reasons that I make very few mistakes about PEDs publicly, I mean, I have an open policy. If you want to, you know, refute something I'm saying, have at it. I'm all fucking ears. Re- the reason I never lose arguments is I only argue what cannot be argued. And what I mean by that is I used performance enhancing drugs for 12 years before I got on that soapbox and started t- talking about them. 12 years of use. Doing. I made every mistake you could possibly make, but I made it before people knew who I was. Did, yeah? did you track everything going on in your body for that 12 years or a good chunk of it to see exactly how it's affecting you? No, no. The reason I say that is you have to remember, I was the bro. You, you understand mm. what I mean? It was only yeah. when I started to learn you know, the, how, how ridiculous some of the behaviours that we have are that I started to apply my you know, engineering skill set to the task. And there was very definitely a transition from what I did in the early days was what everybody did. Yeah. And I just started listening to things and going, that, that, that can't be right. I mean, I'll give you a simple example, like really, really simple example. There are many people out there that will say things like Anavar is 600% more anabolic than testosterone. Stupid. Right? But you, all you need to understand is, but anyone that's ever used Anavar and used testosterone is going to say, let's just say this is the language we communicate in. These drugs have multiples of anabolic potential over the others. And, and if we're fair about it, but that's what we said for 50 years. You know, this drug is more potent than this drug. And I don't mean 10%, I mean 700% more. Does that make sense? And a- a- anyone that's ever used these drugs, going, that can't be right. Like, I mean, like, I use Anabar and I've used testosterone and they both work. You know, I-, I lean into this over that because I prefer this over that, but multiples of anabolic potential, there's no clinical literature to support that. There's no observational evidence to support that. But there's 50 years of guys forcing it down our throat that, you know, such and such a drug is... 400, 500, 600, 700, 1,000 times more anabolic than, than testosterone. But anyone with a rational mind and two years of drug experience would look at that and go, that can't be right. That, there's, there's, that data is corrupt. And so this is why I have mm-hmm. created so much controversy in the industry is when you look at it, most coaches have, don't have very much experience I've done a couple of shows. I don't agree that that's the right mindset. Coaching is something that you do when when you've retired, if that makes sense. You go, I had a long and successful career as a bodybuilder, and I certainly have not you know, achieved the level of success that you guys have, but I've done 37 shows. After 37 shows, I have something to say about competition preparation. If that makes sense, yeah. I, I'm not being funny, but if you was the same when when I was competing, I put so much into the, the into prepping myself, and obviously your energy levels are so low. You're, I'm brain dead. There is no physical way I have energy energy to put into prepping somebody else at the mm-hmm. same time. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know how people do it and prep themselves uh, as well as taking on 20, 30 guys. There's no way they are putting in enough energy into those people no, I to agree. actually than what they deserve yep so this is where i I upset a lot of people because i i say things like they are most people that are coaching today in my opinion should not be coaching i just that's how i feel about it 
you know, I, I'm, I before we've never met before, and I'm hearing all these stories about how controversial you are and how many people you've upset, and I'm expecting something very different because I'm trying, I'm trying here, and I'm finding it hard to disagree with anything you're saying, and I'm exactly the same wavelength as you at the moment. I agree with every word you're saying. Here, here, here is the great challenge: is if you actually listen to what I say, listen to what I say. Nothing I say is controversial. It's only controversial because it's disrupting what the what the norm is today or what the historical message was. So if you say he's a disruptive force, I'm probably the most disruptive force bodybuilding has seen in the last 50 years. But if you listen to what I say, show me the evidence that says when you take Trembolone, you will grow five times faster or five times bigger than if you took an, an equivalent dose of testosterone. There's no evidence. The evidence don't exist. It does, but it's, it's, not- it's, it's, it's fucking made up. It's just made yeah. up. And so people get upset because you understand people have published books and taken people's money and people have run seminars and people have made websites that say this. And when I come along and say, that's fucking made up, I upset people. But here's the challenge is, Show me I'm wrong. I'm right. And being they, they don't have the scientific papers that back any of that up, and it's all just going sure. from word to word. So it's what you just said, trembolone versus testosterone. Trembolone is an extremely harsh drug that mm-hmm. it's very, very potent, and it's way, way more androgenic than testosterone, which is gonna give you strength and aggression and lots of side effects. Whereas testosterone is far more anabolic. Mm-hmm. Then Trembolone. So how can it possibly give you more muscle gains than so so uh, so I, I'm go- I'm going to pull you up there a bit because I I like people to have their opinion and I don't want to mm-hmm. drill down this because I've had this conversation many times and I think we should talk about new things but just very quickly because I'm mindful that content like this ten years from now people will look back on and realize the watershed moment that we went through yeah. So just for the sake of clarity, understand this, that Trembolone is like other anabolic steroids, a drug that was derived so that we could give it to the androgen sensitive so they could realize the therapeutic benefits of testosterone without the androgenic impact. Does does that all make sense, that language? Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Trembolone, when it was in human clinical use, one of the indications was for osteoporosis. Okay, there were a few indications. So human use, we would give it to people who are suffering from malnutrition, cachexia, cancer-related muscle wasting, interestingly, bed sores, and, and, and osteoporosis, the four primary indications. Now, if you think about it, just rationally, logically, why the hell would they give women who are suffering from osteoporosis a drug that was more androgenic than testosterone? Just that. If you go, okay, so you open up the product insert with test from Trembolone, Paravolin in the day, and it says indications, osteoporosis, right? And we know it was given to women and we know the dosage it was given. Just that thread should be enough to go, there's something missing from that story because why would they do that? Why wouldn't they give them a drug that was less androgenic than testosterone, but brought with it the therapeutic benefits of testosterone? And of course, when you pull out the literature and lay out the studies, Trembolone, like para, like Primabolin and Anavar and Nandrolone, is actually approximately as anabolic as testosterone, give or take. It has some unique properties that we can leverage in bodybuilding, but as a general rule of thumb thrown against the androgen receptor, it is an anabolic agent that works, but it is actually a steroidal SARMs in so much as it is significantly less androgenic than testosterone. There is no clinical literature that supports it's more androgenic. It's just made up. Right? And, and, and the bro in me says, where did I begin this journey? It was when saying, well, why the fuck did they give it to women? Like, it doesn't make any sense. Why would they give a highly androgenic drug to women? And for those indications like, you know, cancer-related muscle wasting and malnutrition, that doesn't make any sense if that makes sense. And you pull on these threads and where you get to is you go, everything we know about Trembolone is basically fabricated. It's, it's manufactured information that, that there is no credible evidence to support. Is that because Trembolone never actually really made it through a human trial? No, it was the, the difference it was, between... It was short-lived, wasn't it? 
No, it was in human use for 30 years. The problem was it was never used in the US or in the UK. It was pretty much restricted to the French market. It was manufactured in the European and, and just, so it was really considered. I, I, I'll explain something about anabolic steroids most people don't understand. All the anabolic steroids in common use today are fundamentally competitors to each other. And what I mean by that was initially when we synthesized testosterone and we gave it to women, we got the therapeutic benefits we were looking for, but along came this issue with virilization. So many different pharmaceutical companies set about trying to solve that problem. This is the engineering. Here's, so here's a problem, here's a solution. And what's interesting is Masteron, Anavar, Anadrol, Nandrolone are all solutions to the exact same problem. How do we create a drug that we can give to the androgen sensitive to realize the therapeutic benefits of testosterone, but at lower androgenic impact? So they are effectively competitive offerings that you find, you know, market into niches. But when you put them all together, you're kind of going, it was really, they don't do different things. They're, they're designed to basically meet that need in the androgen sensitive, which completely changes the framework of how you view these drugs. Then what you do is you see them as saying they're actually designed to be brought to market as competitors to each other in much the way, the same way you might look at berberine and say metformin. They're not identical. They certainly do different things. They actually have a different mechanism of action, but the outcomes are remarkably similar. You could almost view them as either or. Yeah. I've got a, li a little question for you. Just going back to the Trembolone. Sure. I'm, I'm learning here. You, you were very advanced on the uh, drug side of things. Uh, I was always led to believe Trembolone is very harsh. It pushes your blood pressure very high mm -hmm. and you get some severe side effects. Um, you're saying if it's not that anabolic, what, what part of the steroid is actually uh, making these severe side effects? Because my the doctor who I work with who does all my bloods, he always says stay away from trembolone because mm. everybody that I see on their bloods is trembolone doing more damage than most of these drugs. The most so important thing to understand about anabolic steroids is there are a number of different potential mechanisms of reaction or pathways that we consider. Generally, guys are talking about the cell-based androgen receptor. So here's an androgen and it binds with the androgen receptor and it causes a cascade of events. We can just call it gene transcription and, and, and outspills these actions. What people don't understand is those drugs are also capable of having what, and that, and that is what we call classic genomic action. Yeah. And then there's a, a whole class of uh, act, actions that are basically considered non-genomic actions. So where these, the same molecule actually binds with a different receptor. Does that kind of make sense a little bit? Yeah. So you might have heard that Trembolone has a higher affinity for the for 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 the uh, progesterone receptor than testosterone does. Does that make sense? Yep. So so the reason Trembolone has the appearance of strength is because when it binds with the androgen receptor, for all intents and purposes, it accretes protein tissue at the same rate as any other anabolic steroid does but it has a novel or a different relationship with other receptors in the body that cause us to feel things like aggression. So force production and protein accretion are through two different pathways. Yeah. So if you're trying to elicit force production and you're going to use aggression to channel that, then Trembolone unquestionably has a discussion topic there. Yeah, but as a simple agent, as a as a what we call a ligon to throw against the androgen receptor to accrete protein tissue, it's just another anabolic steroid. It doesn't work remarkably. The problem being is this, and that is those off androgen receptor signaling pathways are potential things that we could leverage, but they're potential threats to us as well. Yeah. So a lot of the problems with potent steroid of progestins is what happens in your head. So I don't know what your experience with Trembolone is, but if you speak to most people, the Trembolone, as you raise the dosage, you start to have things like disrupted sleep hygiene, even aggression, sexual dysfunction issues. That's not by the androgen receptor. It's that drug acting through other separate metabolic pathways in the human body. And some of those we can leverage to great effect. For example, the reason Trembolone is such an effective competition preparation drug 
is its relationship with the glucocorticosteroid receptor, right? It has More effect- in the muscle. Yeah, but that's not that's not protein accretion. That's something different. If that makes sense, yeah. You so, get a really rock hard full look. Yeah, so you get a look, you get a mindset, you get a thing. But the problem is the trade off is this: if all you want is another fifteen pounds of quality tissue, what I would argue for is well logically you choose the most benign option there is right That's and right. and lean into that right if you don't need the potent potential of something like trembolone just because it's dude it's just 15 pounds of muscle why would you lean into the high risk category of drug why would you not choose the most benign option there is and, yeah. and the problem is is that we told people that it's more potent it's stronger it's more anabolic so people are always going to want that that's what they want but the moment you start telling people look they all accrete protein tissue at the same rate it's what else they do off of the androgen receptor that determines which drug when how much and why this is not controversial this just pisses people off because i'm saying you guys have been talking shit for 50 years you don't know what you're fucking talking about you know my uh, my protocols would normally be I tell people to stay away from trembolone until probably the last six weeks up to a competition if they compete in, and because of that reason where it's pushing more glycogen to the muscle and keep that hardness, the fullness, we're really ready for the show. Um, because of the factors like it's really pushing your your um, your blood pressure high. Just that alone is going to have some drastic effects long term on your body, as, as you would know. You so, so if we if we if we just talk about that, what I would argue is this: the angiotensin two molecule and the aldosterone molecule are the effective molecules of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Now, okay, let's dumb that down for people like right, me. And, fantastic. You know, okay, well, so. So you understand that if you went to the doctor and you were not a bodybuilder and you were experiencing hypertension, your blood pressure was elevated, right? What your doctor would say is that we need to give you a, a, a dietary regime change, ideally, you know, improve your diet, improve potentially your training behaviors, you know, like if you don't, I mean, we're not talking, we're talking to non-bodybuilders here, right? Like okay. Drop some weights, do more right. You need to do this, you need to do this. Everybody's heard these things, right? But Ultimately, if they are unsuccessful in attenuating the elevated blood pressure, they're going to eventually write you a script for some medicine. Okay. And that medicine is going to be one or two classes of drug. Well, there's actually a number of classes of drug, but most likely it will be either an angiotensin receptor blocker or, or what we call it ACE inhibitor. Okay, an, an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. Okay, these are the most common. Yes, there are other ones. We can use diuretics. Yes, we can use calcium channel blockers. Yeah, yes, we can use beta blockers. But typically, we start with ACE inhibitors and ARBs. Now, the they're reason- all going to have other potential side effects. So you want to do the ones with the least. Correct. So, so these medications basically lower angiotensin two, right? And as a result of that, they basically mitigate hypertension. They bring your blood pressure down. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Yeah. When we take anabolic steroids, one of the consequences of taking these drugs, and I should also say other PEDs, what happens is as a consequence of taking that drug, these effector molecules are elevated. Okay. It's the elevation of those molecules that underlie most of the ills that plague our tribe. Things like hypertension, things like um, you know, elevated hematocrit levels, you're in the, you know, on and on it goes. You know, you've heard of left ventricular hypertrophy, remodeling of the, 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 the cardiac system. This is all a consequence of that. Now, if you went to the doctor and basically said, look, you know, I have uncontrolled hypertension and he gave you an angiotensin receptor blocker, what you have to understand is all anabolic steroids have the potential to elevate that molecule, Okay. There's no clinical evidence that says Trembolone is worse at it than any other drug. They all do it. Nandrolone does it. Testosterone does it. Trembolone does it. Now, if someone wanted to sit and, and, and make the argument that Trembolone is the worst of those drugs based on what they have observed in, in client practice, that's the whole point I mean about you know, working with other people. That's completely fair. The point I'm making is, but there's no clinical literature to support that. Okay, so we then rely on observation. 
That may well be your observation. It's completely valid. I'm very interested in your observations, but it's not my observation. And I'll tell you why. Usually, people don't take as much trembolone as the take of the other drugs. I'll give you just a sample cycle. Let's say someone's taking 500 milligrams of testosterone and 600 milligrams of prima bolin and 200 milligrams of trembolone. It's not adding the 200 milligrams of trembolone to the table that causes the problem. It's the sum total of the inputs. Does that make sense? Yeah. So really taking the 200 milligrams of trembolone off the table, okay, you might see some relief, but it doesn't make the problem go away because people that don't use trembolone still experience those consequences. Left ventricular hypertrophy, you know, you know, hypertension, uh, hematocrit level. I'm sure you know this. The number one reason that men are taken off TRT globally by their doctors is elevated hematocrit. They're not being given right uh, trembolone. They're given relatively small doses of testosterone, and yet they're still that therapy is removed because see we see an elevated hyper, uh, in hematocrit. The reason hematocrit goes up it's a complicated so mechanism. For people that, that doesn't know that, Mister B, that's the increase of red blood cells. Is yes. that what you're talking about? Correct, correct, yeah. yep. Just for anybody who's not quite sure what you... Because you do do a lot of doctor terms. I'm just really I, trying to... Do I, I appreciate that. It's, please tell me. I, I'm a big believer. I think I think it was Albert Einstein, I, by no means am I comparing myself to him, once said that if you can't explain it simply, you don't know what you're talking about. So yeah, if, if I explain to a child, yeah. then correct. you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what you're talking about. So, so in the simplest terms possible, what I would argue here is that if we, if we understand that even TRT has the potential to raise hematocrit red blood cell count, okay? Not, not it, many people know about this, and this is the problem, and people, yeah. it's okay to do TRT for life, not mm -hmm. even checking their bloods and how their red blood cells are slowly creeping up, sure. which you know, can cause blood clots and stuff and kill he, you. He, here's, the, here's the challenge with, with, with the process, and that is, so removing blood, the, the procedure called a phlebotomy, is not a solution. Why? Because you have a stimulatory force in place, the androgen itself, and it's resulting in this outcome. And if you take the blood away, it gets replaced. If you take the blood away, it gets replaced. If you take the blood away, it gets replaced. The solution is very simple. We introduce the medication angioretensin receptor blocker, right? and that then mitigates the need to be worried about hematocrit. It just lowers it down. You know, so you have again this behavioral practice that says, you know, we check our blood work, our hematocrit's high, we donate blood. This is a fool's errand. You're not, unless you remove the stimulus, taking the excess blood away doesn't do anything because the stimulus represents the stimulus represents how you address it's, it's a quick fix for now, but it's not going to. It's going to continue to carry on. Yeah, but here's the question is, if you take blood out today, how long will it be until your body has replaced what you took out? Like, it's not... Doing it every few days or every week. It's day. We're talking days here, yeah? yeah? And so what people need to understand is that practice of donating blood has always been a fool's errand. It's a silly thing to do that makes no sense. What is far easier is to address the underlying problem, which is when you introduce androgens, you raise the effective, mo effective molecules that cause those outcomes. Let's go to the root of the problem and address the root of the problem in a rational, structured, and systematic way, rather than continually battling against you know, the, the side effects or the, or the consequence of use. Let's go to the heart of the problem here. I, th I think this is the biggest problem in, in most people in their health this day and age, is they never try to fix the actual problem. They just look for a solution, how to stabilize it. Or The thing is, I don't think a lot of people this know, is... know this, though, Dean. And the thing is, right, is this is, is speaking true to me, because this is literally, I, I'm listening to say, and this is exactly what I've been doing, my last lot of blood work said that my hematocrit was up and I've been doing bloodlets. Um, mm. So I'm listening to this now and I'm waiting for the takeaway message. I'm waiting for the summary of, and I'm going to be uh, trying to find whatever it is he suggests that I should be taking. Yeah, you know I, mean? I, can, I, can, I can help you with that takeaway. The, the key point I would make here, though, is really what I'm trying to communicate to the tribe is not prescriptions. In other words, do this, do this, do this. I'm trying to explain frameworks. Okay. So the idea of a framework then is it's kind of teach a man to fish. Once you understand what's happening in the background, you can solve your own problems. You don't need to be given a prescription every time there's a problem. Yeah. So one of the problems I ask people to understand is in Western medicine, doctors don't 
act in a proactive or prophylactic manner. It's not how we treat patients. We wait until there's a problem, then we address the problem, and then we can't address the problem, we escalate the problem down the track. And this is a, cl a classic example would be, so right now the world is in a, in a, in a epidemic of type 2 diabetes. I think it's fair to say, right? But how I was we just wanted to get onto diabetes because it's one of the biggest problems in the world, and yep. it's it's exactly what you're saying. It winds me up yep. that people are doing all these drugs and all these things to, to try and prevent or stop the diabetes. Just stop eating shit in the first place. Stop shoveling sugar and simple carbs into your body because it will cre create well, type one two of, diabetes over I, time. I don't disagree when we're talking about that particular cohort. Citizen Joe, one of the problems is when we redirect the conversation to our tribe, yeah, it's, in my opinion, impossible to avoid outrageous food intake. It's impossible to avoid. So when you stack the too much food and when you stack then drugs that lower insulin resistance on top of each other, it is an inevitable outcome that you're going to see problems with insulin resistance. And so there are two strategies. One is that you wait until you have a problem and you address the problem, and then you wait till you have a problem and address the problem. Or the other one is to say, look, preemptively, we know that people like us, guys like us, are going to have these classes of problems. Here's a framework that we can use preemptively or proactively right, to get in front of those problems so they don't present at all, yeah. The challenge, of course, being is what we need to ask is, so what risk is associated with any medication we might deploy under that framework? That's a very practical and fair conversation, yeah. But th where I'm going with this is, for example, historically, PD planning was a case of eight weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, 20 weeks. That's how we plan PED use, the next 20 weeks. Yeah, what I'm trying to encourage guys to do is you need to think in terms of the next 20 years. Yeah. yeah. So here's the thing. After 50 years of us talking about PEDs, I'm the only person that's ever come along and, since it su and suggested one simple thing. Stop talking about 20 weeks. Start talking about 20 years. If you think about it, it's such a fucking obvious statement to make. How is it possible that I'm the only person that's ever said this? What I should say is we need to think about 20 years and every single coach and every single educator in the world needs to stand up and say, fuck, the guy's right. We think like 20 weeks out, we need to start thinking 20 weeks out. What else have you got there, Victor? And instead of doing that, they get all upset because I'm disrupting what they have been making a living from for the, for the last 50 years, which is 12 week cycles, 16 week cycles, 20 weeks. Cycles. Nobody in the history of bodybuilding has ever spoken in terms of what, let's talk about drug use for the next 20 years of your life. Nobody has ever done that. And that's, that's why I upset so many people because my message is so disruptive. I, I'm with you 100% in everything you're saying there. And the biggest problem is, is people don't look to the future and they're looking for the now. And when people are pushing out, I'm going to get you the biggest you possibly can, the best shape in the smallest amount of time. That's very desirable. And people want to hear that. And they throw money at that. And they do not think about next year, let alone 10 years down the line. And that's a huge problem. And they are delivering exactly what they're saying. They get them massive in the shortest time possible. But there's always a massive consequence that comes along with that. And they do not care until it happens to them. And then when they hit 40 and they've got all these kind of fucking problems, they just accept it and say, oh, I'm getting live, getting, getting old now. That's just how life is. It's not how it is. You create your future by your daily actions. Agreed. And so this is the great problem. In seven years of me making content, no one has ever successfully refuted a single thing I've ever said. No PhD, no medical doctor, no coach, no thing. They don't like what I say. But if you think that you can sit there and argue that a 20-week plan is superior to a 20-week, 20 20-year 20 plan, you're going to fucking lose. Yes. You're, in, you're going you to lose. To know, at the end of the day, you need to know what your goals are. And if your goal is to get on the Olympic stage, look the biggest you possibly can, it's going to massively impact your health if you're going to be 
doing anything it takes to get there. If your plan is, I want to look the best I can and have great longevity and health, then you need to really look into this and be very sensible about what you're shoveling into your body on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I agree with you. I, and I understand why people get pissed off with you because mm -hmm. you're probably taking from their pocket yeah. by giving out this evidence, which is factual evidence, because it is going to impact their business when they're pushing out these protocols, agree. Which, which are, they are delivering, but they're fucking people's health up. Here's the, here's the great challenge with this whole process is I have a lifetime exposure plan. Maybe you can give me a little attitude to explain what it looks like. Yeah. Imagine if our tribe just made two simple changes, only two changes. The first one is this. You don't, nobody starts PEDs until they feel that they can defend their strategy on training, nutrition, and over-the-counter supplements. And what I mean by that is you need to tell me what you're doing and as a peer, I will listen to it and say, oh, well, that's not what I would do, but I support that. You know, and that makes a lot of sense you know, versus a whole bunch of garbage that you spew out. You should be able to defend your position on training, supplementation and nutrition before you start drugs. I think that's very fair. That's part of my 20 years as a natural bias. I don't expect anyone to do 20 years naturally, but guys today are wanting to get on the gear far too early. Yeah. So I would argue that should be the first litmus test. Can you successfully defend against one of your peers describing what your strategies are in those domains? Now, once you have that, the logical thing to do is to say, okay, now, now we start talking about PDs. All right. Now, I'm not saying you can't start using PDs, but it just makes no sense to push on into what I deem to, to be the, the domain of risk, elevating risk until you understand what you're doing in the PED domain, right? This is not how we work. Guys are waist deep in PEDs, walking around using large quantities of toxic you know, strategies when they don't understand 101 of PED uh, deployment. It just makes no sense. If we did two things, said you don't start until you understand this, Right. And then when you do start, we can give you some drugs so that you can enjoy the drugs, because part of that is experiencing them and learning about them so you can speak to them. But we contain the dosages to the point whereby they're not really causing you unreasonable toxic outcomes and you can sustain the stress for multiple decades. Yeah. And along that journey, at some point in time, when you say, look, I feel like I can defend my drug strategy in the same way I defended my training strategy, then you elevate the risk. But that is not how we teach drugs. How we teach drugs is you're waist deep into it. And then you're asking about post-cycle therapy when you're 12 weeks into your first cycle, you, you, you have to be honest and say, that's our culture. You, you go on any forum and guys are asking about post-cycle therapy and they're telling you I'm at week 12. What do I do? Some of this, you know, some of this I is think, ignorant I still, Victor, I think, because um, I, I would have thought I'd been able to defend my position until having a conversation with you. Um, but going back to what we were talking about with the... Um, uh, hypertension and the uh, raised blood cell count and stuff, um, the ACE inhibitors and all that. So is there a trade-off for side effects? You worried now. No, I so want to... Look the answer. He wants no, no, no. Let, 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 me, let me give you the answer then, but, but allow me to add a little value, yeah? Because rather yeah. than give you... So what I would say is we need to understand as a tribe that our enemies are as follows. The elevation of the effector molecules of the ren and angiotensin system, which is aldosterone and angiotensin 2. That is the first enemy. The second enemy is insulin resistance, which is the enemy of the diabetes epidemic. The third enemy is oxidative stress, okay? And, and then chronic inflammation, okay? So when you kind of go down this list, now, what I would argue is rather than wait until these enemies have done their nasty little business and you're trying to deal with the problems is you get in front of the problem, right? So by introducing an ARB, an angioretensin receptor blocker for everybody that uses performance enhancing drugs at super physiological range, you effectively remove many of the problems that we deal with. Left ventricular hypertrophy, the treatment model for left ventricular hypertrophy is an ARB. Why do we need to wait until we have cardiac remodeling before we deploy the treatment strategy? Good question, right? So 
the issue with hematocrit level, rather than pulling blood out, why don't we use an ARB? Because ARBs basically will control that for us. We don't need to worry about that then. Obviously, what we do is we put the strategy in place and we look at our blood work. But when you start looking at your blood work and you get the problems gone away, you understand what I'm saying? When we have you know, hypertension, when we have all these problems, I'll give a simple example. Lipid skewing is one of our enemies. I'm sure you know what lipid skewing is. Yeah. So we can, out for, okay. out for so, so, so lipid skewing in its simplest form is basically saying that our high density cholesterol carriers are negatively impacted by the use of anabolic steroids, they, they get suppressed. And our you know, cholesterol levels, our low density cholesterol carriers are elevated. So we have this skewing, skewing effect, right? And the consequence of that is then we ask, well, the, the relationship between those two is to make sure that we don't end up with arterial plaque deposits, right? The threat is if there's an imbalance and that system is unable to function correctly, then we can, at the end of the day, end up with arterial to plaque deposit. That makes sense, right? So lipid skewing is a known consequence of the use of anabolic steroids. And and that's what happens when you take steroids, right? Now, if you add an aromatized inhibitor on top of that, that class of drug also contributes negatively in that regard. Okay, so you have one plus one. Now you have a, a multiplication factor of it's even worse, right? Whereas if you take the AR, so the aromatized inhibitor away from the equation and replace it with an angiotensin receptor blocker like telmosartan, which is one of eight different ARBs, one of the things that telmosartan does is addresses the lipid skewing problem. Yeah. So by changing the drugs that we've used, we've now have a drug that rather than making everything worse, makes everything better. Yeah. So the answer to your question is managing angiotensin 2 and managing aldosterone is a problem that every enhanced bodybuilder needs to sit down and have a strategy for. There are two, there are two models. One model is wait until you have a problem and address it then. Or two is get in front of the problem so you don't ever have the problem. And I advocate for the second one, right? Well, the Based problem is prevention though, Victor, is always so, your best attack. Yeah, it? but some people oh. think the, the, the cure is doing bloodlets. That's the problem. This is this is all news to me, you know? Like, the, 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 the challenge is, though, is, you know, this is what I mentioned to you before about there's only one PhD with a, a, a with a, there's only one individual within our tribe that has a PhD in androgen toxicity. And if you come over to my channel, you hear him talk about hematocrit one-on-one with a podcast with me. So this is not a guy with a PhD in protein metabolism. This is a guy with a PhD in androgen toxicity. And he's telling you, why are you doing that? Why, why? It makes no sense. We need to be far more careful with who we listen to. You need to demand credible evidence to be presented on the table. One of the things that has annoyed me more than anything else is this. There's a number of performance-enhancing drug educators in the world. If they did nothing more than said, Victor Black sucks, I'm going to break down his models and tell you everything that's wrong with them, I would love them to do this, right? And they should be talking about everything that's wrong about my models publicly. The reason they don't is there isn't an argument. And you you successfully back up everything you're saying in it and break it right down to a scientific level. I, I, I'm happy very... to have I'm happy to talk to the papers themselves, to talk to experts. Like when I started talking about brain health, this is a classic example, people literally laughed at me. Like, this is a fucking joke. You must be joking. I, I brought a couple of experts on saying, What are you talking about? This is we've you know, 25 papers now on the deleterious impact of elevated androgens on cognitive function. You know, we just listen to the wrong people. And when we go back to, like I said to you at the beginning, how many coaches are there that basically, you know, talk about, you know, things that have done one show. If you think about it, if you're honest, let's not name any names, but if you start laying out names of educators that you listen to and you look at that track record and you say, you know, and like this guy's, you know, influencing this tribe, but he doesn't really stack up when you put him under the spotlight. You know? It so, makes no sense to me when people take on coaches and pay them hundreds and hundreds of pounds. And I always say to people, 
if you're going to have a coach, I always prepped myself and, and made me learn more about myself and my body. But if you're going to take a coach on, go to somebody that's been there and done it consistently and won. If mm-hmm. they keep doing it and keep winning, then obviously they have the right formulas. It's not just a one-off or I did one show and I looked like shit and I came first out of one on stage. That's fucking bullshit. If you're going to pay all that money to somebody, go to somebody that has a good reputation and has actually achieved it themselves. Can I can I make a suggestion here? And this is one of the reasons that I am very bullish on asking people to listen to John Dewitt. Yeah. I'm sure you know who John is, right? John Dewitt. The he Mr. Loves Ele- it. Yeah. Okay. So John, John actively admits that a great deal of his frameworks I can't have come from my material. He's very honest and very open about that. But what he brings to the table, he's a Mr. Olympia level competitor. Doing, and he's making educational content that everybody can listen to. So you have this triad, like, I mean, it's fair to say that he's leveraging my frameworks. I encourage that. Yeah. But he also brings his personal craft to the table. Yeah. And his success as a coach, but he's also making content. So you don't need to even engage with him one on one as a coach. You can just join his John Dewitt University and listen to his content. Yeah. And so we're we're slowly making inroads where a number of high profile people nowadays are starting to use these models. And that helps us tremendously because the one weak link in the process is, as you said, we need some very high profile coaches that have been there and done that to start to adopt these models. And then what will happen is we will reach a tipping point that the adoption of these frameworks simply takes off. But for now, it's literally one mind at a time. I have to, I have to reach one guy at a time because they need to come to the table and say, look, this is what I thought I knew. And then I can go through all of those points one at a time and explain to them using evidence and using uh, observation and, and, and practical, you know, what I call common sense to explain donating blood every two weeks is not, is not solving the problem. You need to get to the underlying root cause of the problem. So to, to, ask, to ask your things, question. Things like that, sorry, but things like that become just a normal protocol in bodybuilding. Yeah. Everyone just says, oh, you do that, you do that, you'll be fine. And they don't want to hear you got to come off these drugs, you got to do this or whatever. All they want to hear is how can I keep taking shit and get around the problem? So because so-and-so down the road said, oh, if I just donate blood once a month, I'll be fine. I can carry yeah. on taking it. So they want to hear that. They jump yeah. on the back of that. Then they will push it out to everybody else. That's the problem, especially mm-hmm. in it's, bodybuilding. It's not, it's not even that. It's not just that, though, Dean. Like it's, um, and I'm not throwing anyone under the bus here, but there's people that are doing blood work in the UK. And as part of the recommendations of raised blood, uh, red blood cells is bloodlets. That is the recommendation that comes on the back of that. Hey, I'll, um, throw, I'll, I'll throw the guy under the bus because I'm the arsehole here. And I don't <laughs> mind. I'm really honest. Here's the reality. If you look at Dave Crossland, I assume that's who you're talking about, right? <laughs> he did. I, and I, I'm, just, I'm just being honest. I'm just being honest he here. Like, he looks like a figure of health. Let's put that up. Let, let me just let me just be honest. The only reason we know who he is is because he literally did everything you could probably do wrong. You know, that's that's who he is. He's the guy that did everything wrong. Well, that was on purpose, right? No, I, I agree with it. I have no problem. But then at some point, that, that's how you get wise. You learn from mistakes. But if you're pushing your mistakes out, then it's I, not that's wrong. I, I do agree. But here's the challenge, and that is, at some point, you don't get. To, it's it's very much like that. I don't. I mean, Boston has passed, but at some point, you don't get to change lanes and suddenly become the harm reduction expert. You, you almost need to say, look, you know, and like I, I made every mistake there was to fucking make, do you know? mm. but in the, in the process of learning, these are the things that I did wrong. And bloodletting is one of the things that that's wrong. Like, again, what I, I would encourage you to do is you need to look at the clinical literature, not what someone says. Yeah. It's going to help in the moment, isn't it? But it's not solving the problem. No, it'll make, everything, it, 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 it'll make everything worse. I'm going to yes. lose the point. That, that I want, I'm going to lose the point. That I wanted to. I've been, I've been quiet because otherwise it will leave my head. Um, one of the questions was regarding to doing bloodletting once you once the root issue. 
doing it as a fast process to then go on to so say you did the root cause or you dropped your dose to a point and then you blood let to kind of fast track into a lower hematocrit does but that clin- have any place cl- clinical phlebotomy has a place i'm not saying it doesn't have a place but here's here's the here's the practical application if you remove the stimulus that's causing the outcome and then use the technique that's a valid discussion but yeah. leaving the stimulus in place and removing the blood you have to understand but it's just going to come back you know, and we have clinical evidence to support that. Yeah, you know, and it you're doesn't. It will come back with a vengeance. It of course it comes back. It comes, yeah. So so you have to understand these drugs were deployed in clinical practice. One of their indications was for the treatment of anemia. That's what yeah. they do. That's how they work. And not their sole mechanism of action, but part of the mechanism of action. They will elevate red blood cell count. That's why they were used in the treatment of anemia. So leaving the stimulus in place and deploying yeah. clinical, clinical point A makes no sense, right? If you smash your head against the wall and then you take, take five minutes off <laughs> and put a plaster on it and then smash your head against the wall again, you're going to still have a smashed head. Correct. And well, if you've you got a plaster on, Dan, there's this cushion and it's okay. <laughs> yeah. the padding. And then, if you, and then if you speak to this conversation rationally, I don't have a problem with a one time or an anomaly deployment of a treatment, but it's not something you can do every eight weeks. Mm. What are you going to do? Like, again, like here's the 20 year plan. So 20 year plan one is every eight weeks, I'm going to go and donate blood. Yeah. And the, and there is a consequence to the outcome. Plan B is, well, why don't we just prevent the escalation of hematocrit? Like, like this is, I mean, this is a simple example. I'll give you an example. What I mean, the difference between the deployment of an angiotensin receptor blocker versus an AI, if we compare the two, right? So estradin, if you understand, is a hypertrophic pathway in its own right, okay? Estrogen is cognitive protective, cardiac protective, and renal protective, okay? This is the bit I wanted to get back to. Great. So if, if we are then taking an aromatized inhibitor for the sole purpose of controlling water retention, and water retention is not directly influenced by estrogen. It's through the ren and angiotensin receptor at the RAS system, right? Why would we not take a drug like an ARB, which allows us to maintain the protective benefits and the hypertrophic benefits of estrogen, but manage the water retention directly through the system that's responsible for water retention? There's two pathways. They both work, but one just makes more sense than the other. Yes, you could donate blood, but why don't you just fix the problem? So if I'm gonna if I'm gonna box this off, because I got a funny feeling we're gonna go down a rabbit hole with this one. Yeah, we can we can end up um, with that same conversation. Pro- protocols, because I am obviously taking quite a lot away from this. And yep. in terms of um, you know, any trade-offs of using the likes of tel- telmasartan and stuff. Um, are, are there anything for people that are watching or listening that that need to understand? Yeah, do you know what do you know what? Uh, GW1516 is, Carterine. Yes. Okay, cool. So if you understand that there are eight different angioretensin receptor blockers that you could plausibly choose from, the one that I lean into is a drug called Telmasartan. And the reason I lean into it is it's a combination ARB and PPAI agonist. And for the people listening, that's what GW1516 was. Right. So you have the benefits of left ventricular cardiac hyper, you know, hypertrophy mitigation, uh, hematocrit uh, thing, your uh, hypertensive reduction in hypertension and all these benefits. And then you have the added benefits of improving lipid profile and mitigating insulin resistance, basically what we call treating of metabolic syndrome. It kind of does what GW1516 does with one exception, and that is GW1516 failed the requirement for standardized toxicity testing and so was abandoned. Telmasartan was required to undergo exactly the same tests and it passed. So again, two drugs, compare them. Two drugs, compare them. Two drugs, compare them. Anytime you've got a drug that one of the drugs passed standardized toxicity testing and the other drug failed, I would argue we're going to begin to lean the conversation into the one that passed. A simple example, and of our past standardized toxicity testing, Anadrol failed. Doesn't mean that you don't ever use Anadrol, but anyone that's proposing you live on Anadrol for the next 20 years is a freaking moron. Damn. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So this is the whole point. So we have AI 
And so we have an aromatized inhibitor and an ARB. There's a choice. We have GW1516 and telemosartan. There's a choice. We have flambellamine versus ARB. There's a choice. And all I'm asking people to do is to have the dialogue because when you have the dialogue, you make your own decisions about what is the best path for you. Yeah, but in terms of protocols and is are there any restrictions over, um, you know, usage of of those uh, like so, so if i am going to start looking into the use of telmosartan etc jolly wants you to write him a, a no, no, so, I, I just no, no. i'm very transparent so so what what i would always recommend we always do with all drugs is you start at the minimum clinical effective dose you establish your inter individual tolerance for that drug which is 20 milligrams a day so telmosartan 20 milligrams a day if you tolerate the drug well, then you look to the effects that you're looking to offset or mitigate with that drug. So, for example, if you took 20 milligrams a day and you did it for 90 days, you would be saying, OK, so the next time I look at my hematocrit, has it come down? If it hasn't come down, you might titrate the dose to the next increment up, because what we're trying to find is the least amount of drug that we can use to realize the therapeutic benefits that we desire and mitigate the side effects. So it doesn't matter what drug, we always start at the minimum clinical effective dose. In the case of telomusartan, that's 20 milligrams once a day. Okay, I know Johnny wanted to box it off, but I want to return to it because the import, the the, the thing and the, and the kind of total thing that everyone was saying, estrogen too high, shut it down. Um, and the new model, I've done all the John Jewett stuff and it's, right. and, it, and it's really good. And there's a reason that, the estrogen is elevated with with increased testosterone dose and it's protective mm. and so when when you then put an ai in you're removing you're making it more dangerous you're removing one of the anabolic pathways you understand testosterone the drug well, yeah, 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 yeah this yeah, is it's, working it's by the as well people it's, so so people it's, it's like saying okay so i want to push estrogen down which is a hypertrophic pathway and it's protective of my kid. I'm going, why, why are you trying to, why are you pushing that down? That makes no sense. I'm pushing it down because it causes water retention, but estrogen doesn't cause water retention. Water retention is managed by the RAS. Estrogen is something simply one of several stimulatory or inhibitory inputs on that system. But from what I can hear, it's always the same protocol and, and it's exactly the same as mine. If your testosterone is so high that you're aromatizing so much estrogen, your estrogen is too high, instead of trying to block the estrogen, why don't you just pull the low, testosterone lower, lower down? Lower the testosterone down, correct. So my strategy is you use as much testosterone as you can tolerate as a genetically unique individual without needing an aromatized inhibitor. Right now, that's 300 milligrams a week. It's 300 milligrams a week. If it's 400 milligrams a week, so what you do is you establish your genetic, you your unique genetic inter individual tolerance for that drug, and this is you use as much as you can tolerate. The idea of using a secondary drug, so you take a primary drug that causes this consequence, you take a secondary drug to push it down. A simple example is many guys are taking trembolone and then taking cabagolene. And I'm kind of going, why don't you just put the cabagolene aside and use a little bit less trembolone because cabagolene has a whole class of problems in its own right. Do you know what I mean? Mate, uh, like sometimes I feel like I'm bashing my head against a brick wall because there's so many people now coming into the first day of the gym, they're taking trembolone, they're taking that 50s, they're doing this, they're doing that. And the same protocols, it's like I have to take testosterone, I have to take um, Tremblone, and then I have to take some Novodex or Rimadex because I'm taking Trem. How, how do you even know? You haven't got your bloods done. You have no idea what's going on in your body. I, and it's just the same protocols given I, out I, to everybody. I get into a lot of trouble because I say things that are, but so far as you're listening to me, I hope you understand, I, I don't consider myself to be a troublemaker for the point of making trouble. I'm trying to help the tribe. You're yeah. making perfect sense to me, and I don't understand why it, people it, are not it, seeing things. I'll give, I'll give you a simple example. I call out Dante Trudell quite a lot, and a lot of people criticize me for that, but I'm going to make the point. Just hear me out. So Dante Trudell is openly critical of the use of what he calls exotic steroids, Masteron, Prima Bowl, and Anivar. Okay. He famously you know, made a, a, a cycle design strategy, admittedly 20 years ago, right, called Cycles of Pennies, where he basically said, look, the simplest, easiest, cheapest, most competent, you know, cycle that I can come up with is testosterone and trembolone. 
Now, he didn't intend to have the consequence he did, but you have to understand when you shit on Prima Bowl and Mastodon and Anavar and say that's the root cause of our problems, and you say the solution is testosterone and trembolone, it doesn't matter what your intent was. The consequences, people are going to come along and read that and re- respect a man of influence and say, well, that's what I need to do. What, what Cycles for Pennies did more than any other single document in our history was drove the adoption of Trembolone. That's just a fact. Saying these drugs, no, this drug, yes, when you have that kind of profile, what the fuck did you think was going to happen? That's not a criticism of an individual. It's just a statement of saying it's pretty hard to defend that. And the challenge is, is rather than stand up and say today, look, I got it wrong. I fucked up. I shouldn't have said that. I didn't know what I was talking about. You know, what a da 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 da. It's, you know, we get into this wanting to protect one's reputation and one's legacy and all that sort of stuff. And we can't have a, an honest forthright conversation. I would have expected Don Trader to be my greatest advocate. You know, someone that comes along and said, I'm always talking to the health of the tribe. Give this guy a listen. I don't necessarily agree with all he's got to say, but he's got some interesting ideas. Have a listen to this guy. He's deliberately and intentionally undermined every move I've ever made. And I'm just honest with you, that's wrong. He should be, if he's really serious about helping this tribe, saying to people, I don't agree with Victor Black, but go and listen to what he has to say and make up your own mind. So you're hearing voices that are talking about these things. Do you think that then goes back? Because there's a certain amount of responsibility from a consumer perspective, and you pointed it out with one of the first points you made about before you use PEDS, like mapping it out yourself, having a nutrition imbalance, and then being able to actually plan out your PED model the consumer like has a certain amount of responsibility to not just read something and go, I should do that. Uh, we all read, we all read the magazines, right? I should do what Ronnie Coleman does. Uh, but actually, we should have known we're not Ronnie Coleman. right? I would, I would argue there's at least a half a dozen influencers in this community that need to take responsibility for what they've done here. One is the user community, Two is the websites. Three is the forums. Even the forum owners, they let a lot of shit talk go on. And I understand it's the nature of the forums, but it's almost this like unmodulated, unregulated free for where people are just handing out shit advice to each other. And I look at it and I think, man, someone needs to step in and clean the fucking forums up. These forum owners are responsible themselves because they're enabling these stupid conversations by having the platform and making profit from it by having sponsors. So it all well, comes back down to that. It's money, greed. They don't give a fuck about people in their health. They're making so, shit tons of money. And, and so the, my point I'm making, you have everybody from YouTube influencers like you know Derek Cole from More Plates, More Dates. You have the coaches. You have the user community. You have the forum owners. You have the educators. Everybody has a responsibility here to basically clean up our act. Yeah. And this is what I'm saying is the number one thing that they can do, in my opinion, is simply this. Just make a post on your social media saying this Victor Black Cat doesn't have a fucking clue what he's talking about. He's a moron. Go and listen to him talk shit. That's all I want them to say, because what will happen is when people come and listen to me talking shit like this, they'll go, hang on a second. That guy makes a fucking lot of sense. So the, I, the irony is, is this is exactly what is running through my head because we've got a couple of UK coaches, which are obviously not your biggest fan. We've, yeah. we've mentioned that we were getting you on the podcast and they've they've mentioned that, uh, you know, they're not best of friends with you. So I came on this podcast already on the back foot thinking, oh, you know, what are we going to let ourselves I, I I want them to tell people he's full of shit so that they will go and listen to what I'm saying. The problem is no one talks about me because they don't want people to hear the conversation. No, but it's it's already already blown my mind. You are full of shit, but it's all good shit. (laughs) It's good shit. I'm so glad we had you on this podcast because I'm with Johnny here. I was on the back foot because we heard bad things. I'm so glad that you came on and Um, really... Just because I want want to drive like forward like a little bit because i think we've covered some of the good bits about yeah. estrogen and, and and like some of the the big boo-boos and stuff like that and just to cover the bit about like the hate and i'm just going to play devil's advocate oh, yeah. far away. like um is it possible that people could have been on their own journey through their own research and stuff like that and come up with similar ideas to yours because some people are saying that they have but some are questionable because they're a bit too similar 
Um, could there have been a, a grey model or a, or a yeah. close something that was let, 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 let me give you a, a, a point in case that hopefully we're... there's a guy called Joe Jeffrey. I don't know whether you know Joe, who Joe is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So when I came across Joe, he was making content on social media. He was already making performance enhancing drug content, just so we're super clear. Yeah. It wasn't what I teach today, but he was talking about performance enhancing drugs. And he was getting a lot of, he was getting a hard time from a lot of people for a couple of reasons. One is he didn't seem to be realizing outcomes of success that would be equated with the amount of drugs that he was using, if you understand what I mean. Yep. So I pulled Joe aside and coached him for free, no money at all for one year. And I taught him all my models. I'll be very honest with you. The reason I did that was because I wanted him to go then go back into the marketplace and start telling people about the black models. Now, if he uses those models to coach other individuals and to make profit, you don't pay me royalties to use my models. All I want is for you to say, these are the black models. This is this big, the black cat's talking this stuff. That's all I wanted, right? So if, if you came and worked with me for a year, Jonathan, right? And I and I taught you everything I did wanted. And then you went out and you said, look, I've developed my own model. And it's literally parroting what I'm saying word for word. You and I are going to have a problem. <laughs> you, you understand what I mean? Like we're going to have a problem. If you start talking about telling a So if you're doing blood donation today and we talk about telling a sartan and I coach you for free for a year. And then six months from now, you're promoting, you know, the the Jonathan model, the Jonathan Red model. You and I, you and I are going to have words, my friend. You understand? <laughs> like this is how it works. So you understand, like even Callum was recently, Callum, I think Race Race Drick was recently on Phil Ed Aviad show. I gave Callum and his entire team free access to my website. He didn't pay free access. What I wanted him to do was to look at the models learn from the models and then disseminate the information to the UK bodybuilding community. And all I wanted in return, there are no royalties. You don't owe me any money. Just call them the black models. You know what I mean? no, So no. this is where, you know, it's not, it's not when you think about how many, you know, changes that I'm putting on the table here and how disruptive the models are, I'm not asking for royalties. There's no licensing fee. There's no. There's nothing more than simply saying it's no different. If you think about it, like I mentioned, Don Trader. Let me be completely fair to Don Trader. I really like dog crap training. I don't know whether you guys are a fan, but I think yeah, it's a very, very good model, right? But, but Victor, like you, you, you keep saying the the black models, and I know Black Lives Matter and all that. Can we have some <laughs> white models, brown models, yellow models? Because they might start seeing you as very racist. <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately unfortunately that's my surname i can't get away with it <laughs> so I, I guess the point the whole point i'm making here is that i i felt that we have a collective responsibility to help the tribe and i have found individuals within the tribe to be very focused on personal agenda and preservation of reputation and financial gain Rather than just common decency, Victor, to be honest, pal. If, if you've gone out, you eat to help people, and then for them to credit you for that is not a lot to ask for. I think you're not asking for a lot. Uh, well, this is what I was saying about reason. the Dante Trudell thing. I still, I still to this day, like if I was to, for all intents and purposes, replicate dog trap training, I would expect people to fucking have at me. Like that's fucking dog crap. What are you doing? You're just ripping the guy off. Yeah. You know, I mean? he, he developed the models, he promoted the models, he spent countless hours helping people to understand you know, how to apply them, at least call them what they are. That's called dog crap training for fuck's sake. You know what I mean? Well, I mean, in academics as well, for, for people who consider themselves an academic based, like educator or a, or a, a pra like that, like citation is, is the very essence of that. And maybe it just shows a bit of a, a gap in like how academics tip their hats to each other. You know, maybe I, 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 I will tell you, I do understand. I'll tell you why. If we're really honest, you go and look at every Psalms website or every steroid website in the world, all of them, right? I don't know whether you understand this or not. You, I think inherently will, is they're all clones of each other. They're all just scraped copies. Like someone wrote something and come and copied it and pasted it. And now they have another site. Now, I don't really know you know, which website was the first website, but it's fair to say, if you line up a hundred websites, they are for all intents purposes, all carbon copies of each other, no accreditation, no hat tipping goes on at all. You know, if you look at YouTube, most people that make YouTube content 
they're watching YouTube going, oh, that's a good idea for a video. They'll go and make a video on that subject, but they don't attribute the original piece of content that inspired them to make the content. Do you mean? You, I, this is the world knowing it. Everyone's a selfish piece of shit and they're all out just greedy out for money and out for themselves. That, like, I, I, for one, will be pushing your name forward after having this conversation because I generally want to help people and especially their health. We all know that the bodybuilding world is spa from healthy. When people are like, hang on, I'm healthier than Bob down the road. He goes to the pub and smokes fags every day. You might be healthier than that, but that doesn't mean to say that you're healthy. You're not I healthy. I do always love that analogy. I could be smoking crack. Okay, there's, there's two options. There's so only let, two options. So, crack so let, or crack. That's it. So, so let me give you a, a, a final point where you mentioned about the, could there be a gray model or red model? Yeah. It is fair to say that some of the things that I say have been with us for a long time. I, for example, am a strong advocate of testosterone based, but many people have said that. That's not what I'm saying, right? But the introduction of things like, you know, an, RA, uh, an angiotensin receptor blocker explaining that estrogen does not cause water retention, that estrogen is simply a stimulatory factor. This is completely new framework. And the introduction of telemesartan as a means of basically offsetting and mitigating some of these strategies, this is new. This is not how we did things. I'm saying we don't use an AI anymore. So I'm saying things like what we did in the past was blast cruise. Now what we do is called basal and situational use. It's a completely different model. It's not a deviation or variation. I just explained what, uh, what basal and situational means. Historically, what we did was we took so much drugs that we inherently knew we were creating toxic profile. We knew that. And so we pushed along for as many weeks as either we dared on one level or until we saw a problem that scared us enough to back down. And that, that's the definition of cycling. You push and you back down, you push and you back down. What I would argue is simply this, for 99% of us, all we need to do is this, Let's figure out how much drugs that you can tolerate as an individual, as a, as a genetically unique individual. And I'm going to give you that much. And I want you to live there basically on a, you know, a hair and the tortoise model. You know, it might be a little slower than the blast is, but you'll pick it up with not having to pull your head in and offset stress. Yeah. So one model is basal model, which is let's figure out what you can tolerate. Let me give you that. Let me see if you're progressing against that. And my entire strategy is not to cause you stress to the point whereby you say to me, should I stop? And I'm saying to you, why? Why do you need to stop? That's such a different framework that nobody gets to say, oh, yeah, I thought of that as well. That's called basal use. And then situational use is on occasions, we're going to deploy a strategy for power lifters or for competition preparation or for whatever that meets the needs of that community. But for most people, most of the time, all they really want to find out is, so what can I put on the table that I can, for all intents purposes, live on? And I just close off with one statement. My models are based around human use drugs to begin with. And for the most part, drugs that are in human lifetime clinical use. So really, this is not a conversation about can humans use these drugs? And it's not about can we use them for life? It's a conversation about dosage over time and inter individual genetic tolerance. You know? All of these terminologies, all of these frameworks, basal situational use, multiple metabolic pathways, this is an entirely new language. That, that I've brought to the table. Nobody has the right to say, yeah, yeah, I thought of that. Like my idea of like, so rather than taking out a 20 pound sledgehammer and smashing on the antigen receptor as hard as you can, why don't we moderately modulate multiple metabolic pathways? I mean, this is a language where if you listen, you're going, dude, they're saying the same thing. They're, they're literally parroting the words, which is great. And I encourage it. All I want is to say, and by the way, give this guy, Victor Black, a bit of a hat tip. Thank you for bringing this to the table. Yeah. So um, what, what you're saying now, I mean, my, my protocols would normally be like, I'll have three months on cycle and I take just testosterone, six, 400 to 600 milligram a week maximum. Mm -hmm. And then I have a clear out where I have at least three months off. I always have at least the time off. Of what why, why, do, why do you do that? Sorry? Why do you take the time off? 
want to clear my whole system out, detox. And while I'm doing that, because I'm no longer competing, I'm no longer trying to add size. I'm retired from bodybuilding now, but I like to maintain some muscle. Okay. So while I'm off, I do more of a health protocol where I do fasting. I knock my meals down to maybe twice a day and everything I possibly can, which is going to help longevity and health. So well, I want to hold some muscle. So when I go back on, I bump my meals up to six meals a day mm -hmm. and try and grow back into a bit of size, lean up, hold some muscle. So, um, can I, can I ask you some questions there, though? I, I'm just interested in, in your mindset. So when you say you have blocks of time on and blocks of time off, do you mean off mm -hmm. as in I stop the androgens completely and restart my HPTA? I, I'm off everything. Um, okay. I don't even do PCTs because in that time, within about six weeks, six to eight weeks of being off, I get my bloods checked and see how my body's responding. Great. So let me, Because let me I'm give... only taking like four, 600 milligram, it generally coming back to normal range. I understand. Let me, let me give you a simple example when we have that. Understanding that this is a framework you may not have heard before. So if, if, I confused, if I'm confusing you, just tell me to explain it more simply. One yeah. could easily argue that what we really need to worry about today is our heart, our kidneys, and our brain. If you look after these organs, these are the most sensitive organs in the body. Pretty much everything else will follow. Now, that's not a blanket rule, but it's a, it's a, it's a fair framework. So when it comes to brain health, you have to understand elevated levels of androgens are considered to be neurotoxic, high levels of androgens. Ironically, so are low levels of androgens. So the idea of elevating androgen levels and then removing them and restarting the HTP, literally you're going from bad to bad, bad to bad, bad to bad, bad to bad. So that, that period of time that you have off, even though it may logically sound like a, a, a detoxing model, it's actually causing stress for your brain. Because we consider hypergonadal, which is a phase that you must go through to restart the testicular axis, as being neurotoxic. So one yeah. could easily argue that rather than, so I take 600 milligrams sometimes and nothing sometimes, one could easily argue that taking 400 milligrams on a blanket basis, right, may well allow you to realize the same goals, but with a better safety profile. For your brain, your heart, For your brain. about other protocols as in testosterone and sperm count, things like that, how would so, that affect it? So in terms of fertility, right, how, how old are you now? 41. Do you have children? No. Do you uh, desire to have children in the future or like a pregnancy? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. So what I would argue today is there's really three pathways for you. One is to understand that taking anabolic steroids suppresses the HPTA and very plausibly massively diminishes sperm viability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But like myself, many men have children when they're on the gear. You know, I mean? I, I, my son was born conceived when I was using anabolic steroids. A reduction in sperm count doesn't make you infertile. Yeah. yeah. So there's it that. Was, that. Is, when your son came out, was he black? <laughs> no. so, so, so so there's that and then there's the idea of well i need if i want to have a planned pregnancy i need to restart my hpta and re-establish a healthy sperm profile i completely understand but it's difficult to argue that there's merit to doing that now preemptively rather than waiting till you get to the point where you desire that outcome right and then there's the third choice which would be simply leaving the suppressive compounds in place and adding additional pharmacology that override the negative feedback loop here which would basically mean drugs like hmg i don't know whether you're familiar with this with this you know so the idea here is saying okay so I'm not saying it's a terrible idea. You're using very moderate amounts of drugs and then you're inter, in, inter, interfacing that with periods of complete time off, right? But the argument would be is this, and that is if, you're, if you were to change your protocol to say, look, I'm going to try and figure out what I can live on and just live on it, understanding that drugs like growth hormone and insulin and telomersartan and metformin and testosterone, these are lifetime clinical drugs for men. There's millions of men living on these drugs. Why are they? Why do they have to be on them? Though I don't believe they they need to be. They've created those problems to have to take those. Drugs. So so some of them are certainly it's fair to say. Like so, if we looked at type one diabetes, we would say this is a disease yeah. state that you you know you don't really have too much control over. Yeah, if you're born type with two, it, then it's yeah. a different story. 
So growth hormone deficiency, again, you don't really control that, if that makes sense. So I'm 55. I mean, the idea of me not using TRT, I mean, at some point you have to give a guy a break. You, you understand what I mean? I'm not going to be producing 1,300 nanograms per deciliter as a natural 55-year-old I'm, man. I'm all for, for, all yeah. for TRT yep. in specific cases, especially when you get to a certain age or you do want children, things like that. And, yep. and so so where I... Cases, so where I would go with this conversation is I'm not saying you're wrong. All I'm trying to encourage people to do is listen to the discussion. Yeah. That says, look, restarting the HPTA constantly blast off blast off blast off is very, very plausibly the worst model for brain health that there is. And the best model for brain health would be to raise the hypogonadal state and to lower the, the, the super physiological state to a more rational level and just leave it there and say, look, every day is a good day rather than I have 12 weeks of feeling like fucking Superman. And then I have six weeks of feeling like dog shit and 12 weeks. So the whole point is as long as these dialogues are happening as long as people are listening, as long as people are going, well, that's very interesting. What does the clinical literature say? Can, uh, are there experts on this domain? Then I'm a very happy camper. I'm just arguing why are we not having these discussions? Yeah, so how do, yeah, how, yeah. I mean, this is really interesting to me because I, I've not heard about how it would affect your brain or even looked into that. I mean, I'm very much into the health of the whole body through yeah. diet and through not doing stupid things to mess your health up in the yeah. first place. You understand but my point the, being is... It affects your brain. You understand my point is a, a heightened level of androgens could be considered neurotoxic, though. You, you understand yeah. that, yeah? And, and a yeah. hypergonadal state could equally considered to be detrimental to your brain. We have very good evidence to support that in, in the elderly, yeah? Well, so this is brilliant to me because I've not heard anything about yeah. this before, so this is great. So it's just a flattening of the curve. It's not, not really any profoundly different than the idea of rather than injecting ourselves once a week and having this massive sp spike and this, you know, like this, you know, I, I, I've tried to push people onto micro dosing you know, where we're effectively flattening out the curve it's somewhat similar but on a very you know uh, flattened level we're talking about then rather than like over a week we're talking about over a year flat flatten that line out let's figure out what we can what we can live on so what does what does someone like dean need to do to decipher the basal rate that he would need then so just, uh, just, it, just one more thing while you're talking about that as, as well. What, what's your opinion on when you're coming off as it kind of clearing out your receptors so you become, you, you get more effects of going back on after having a little break? Androgen receptors upregulate in the presence of androgens, completely the opposite. Okay, so that's a big myth. Yeah, it's just completely people. fucking made up. <laughs> So, so the idea of like taking a break to refresh the receptors is like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like androgen receptors upregulate the presence of androgens. The opposite happens. Hmm. Um, if you take okay, so too much, so would that dampen them at all? Sorry? If you was taking too much, would that dampen them at all? Uh, I think it's fair to say that more works more, but more hurts more. Yeah. yeah. And there's unquestionably a, a saturation point. I don't know whether you were uh, around in the in the days when, you know, uh, Dan, Dan Duchesne and that was talking and Paul Borenson. Do you know these names? Yeah. yeah. No. no. no, no, no. Okay. We're, we're talking about like, again, I've, I've been at this 40 years. Right. There were guys arguing that there's a something special happens at a certain dose of androgens where you have this new pathway open up. Yeah, but these guys were proposing this pathway happens at you know seven thousand milligrams a week. You, you understand? Like, it's like what the fuck? And and these are the things that people say. You know, in the nineties we use less drugs. I'm going. You clearly weren't around because you weren't aware of the conversations. That were, there were people arguing that you know a two week seven thousand milligram a week cycle, like go on for two weeks, come off for two weeks, go was safer than moderate use. Like, <laughs> like people, what, what the fuck are you smoking? The point I'm making though is that. Yes, it's completely plausible that anomalies occur at very high doses of androgens where we may well reach a saturation point, but those doses we can automatically consider to be toxic. It's not at 1,500 milligrams a week. It's not at 2,500 milligrams a week. It's at 5,000 milligrams a week plus. I was going to move on to, I mean, I, I told you what I take. And when I was at my very biggest in competing, I pushed up to just 
over a thousand, it was about 1100 milligram a week. I mm-hmm. felt like crap on that and had to come off it. It was mm-hmm. too much for me. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, every individual is different to what yep. they can take and what's good for them. But what's your kind of protocol? What do you, what would you say is too much? I'll too t- I'm very honest with people. I like a thousand milligrams a week, but I don't use it because I can't live on it for 20 years. Yeah, it's I, not. It's I, not cool. I, I respond very well to more than a thousand milligrams a week. I'm not a hyper responder. I'm just very fucking captain average. I know that a thousand milligrams a week and more agrees with me. I feel good. I respond well, but I'm also very practical. I'm 55 years old and I want to be using drugs for the next 20 years. I can't live on that. I have to so, put my head so in. Guy- yeah? A guy in his prime, naturally, what produces what seventy to ninety milligram a, a week, give or take a bit. That, 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 but, that's that's difficult to argue. I explain what I mean by that. Is yes, yeah. a, a lot of the testosterone levels that are thrown about on the internet. What you're talking about is middle aged men, right? What we really need is to go and get the data set from the Australian Institute of Sport, where they looked at elite naturals and see, you know, what what do elite naturals produce, right? And the reality is elite naturals walk around the planet at 1,400, 1,300, 1,400 nanograms per deciliter, okay? That's the same level that most young men experience in puberty, okay? So what, what, you, what would that be the equivalent in, in okay. um, so, milligrams a week? So understanding that the way that we metabolize drugs is profoundly individual. I mean, like, yeah. wow, right? In, in other words, I know guys that could realize that outcome on 150 milligrams a week. I also have clinical literature showing that there are individuals that need 500 milligrams a week to realize that level. That's how profound the individual response is. And so you can't really blanket it. All you can do is say, look, here's average, but then you understand we live in a world of outliers. Most people in this tribe that are super successful are outliers to the norm. Okay, Mm -hmm. so when I talk to average, what I would basically be saying is, look, 200 ish milligrams a week ish, right, is the limits of plausibly natural 100 milligrams a week mid range 200, the limits, right, but there's always going to be that guy that that's too much for. And there's going to be that guy that that's not enough for. And so we have to take that into account. And all you can do is deploy that dose give it a little bit and go and look at what that produces in that individual to make a statement for that individual. Yeah? Depending on how the guy absorbs the gear, how good the gear is, and this day and age, it's hard to even get good gear. But, but not, not, lots of factors. not only um, that, it's how, how he tolerates the stresses. I am what I call a draft horse. In other words, you can give me drugs. I just suck them up. Like I don't do anything remarkable with them and I don't experience any outlier problems and what i found in my experience at least and this is what i talk about working with people as a general rule of thumb guys that are hyper responders get very good results and they get lots of problems from small amounts mm. which is an interesting paradox because you have guys over here that are very tolerant like me all right but i don't get a great response i just get an average response and then i have the guys every now and again they come across my table and you give them a little and they explode but they also then have to battle a lot of problems. They are hyper responders in every vector, in every dimension, as it were. And so this is one of the great paradoxes. I made a post about this this morning about, you know, one of the great challenges is when we want to lean into the individuals that have been very successful. If you've ever seen a picture of Lee Priest at 17 years old, right? 13. Got a yeah. Right. So here's the challenge is, so when someone has the capacity to look like that at 17, how credible was his journey to the average trainer when it comes to, well, I did this and I got this outcome because Lee is a hyper responder. Yeah. Yeah. My journey is far more realistic for most guys, which is I'm neither blessed nor cursed. Uh, I mean, you give me drugs and I eat and I grow, you know, but I, I don't explode on you know, th- I need to have 1,500 milligrams a week to compete. You know, and that's what I need. I figured this out over the years. Like to be at my best on stage, I need 1,500 milligrams a week, but you need to understand. But I like competing. I've done so many shows. that I need to be very judicious because I cannot live on that. So I have to be very strategic with how I meet this out. And, and this is where people have never approached it that way. They've simply said, well, for the next 20 weeks, I'm going to do this. 
and then I'll forget about that. And if I can just segue this into female use. So this is a classic example. So one of the things that, that I think best describes what I've done here is I've explained anabolic steroids with women historically looked like this. Pretty much everyone started on anabar. That was how it was, right? And what I'm explaining is this. Anabar is the very, very last drug we give to women. We give them every other drug under the sun before we give them Anabar. Right? I'll explain why. When it comes to women, women are exquisitely sensitive to growth promotion agents. So you can elicit hypertrophic response in women from drugs that seem that they wouldn't do anything for you or I. In other words, what I mean by that is a couple of units of growth hormone, they change. You're in- well, their, their androgen receptors are a lot more in there because they have a lot more estrogen. There's, there's, a, there's a very complex, multifactorial discussion about why that response is, but it's a, it's a true statement. They're hypersensitive to growth promotion agents. But the point I'm making, though, is the problem for women, because the doses are so small, is really not a conversation about organ health, which it is in men. With women, it's really one conversation and one conversation only, and that is virilization. And here's the challenge is, if a woman steps up and she's going to use anabolic steroids for a period of one year, you can pretty much do whatever you want to do. But the problem is that's not how we compete. Now we're going, okay, but I need a 10 year plan for this woman. Right. And you, you can't live on anabolic steroids for a woman as a 10 years and not expect to have a virilization outcome. So we need to have a strategy that says that we do everything we can for women with drugs that are physically incapable of inducing a masculinization outcome. You cannot virilize a woman with these drugs. And only at the very last moment and very strategically and very carefully do we drop anabolic steroids on the top. We don't not use them, but we use them very strategically. Why? And that is because we're going to be exposing this woman to anabolic steroids for 10 years. Year one, it doesn't really matter. I'll give you a simple example. If you've ever been to a major show and you look at the bikini girls and you hear me ranting on about virilization, you look at the girls and go, what is he talking about? These girls look absolutely fabulous, right? Now, hang around, for the, hang, around, hang around for the master's division. If you look at most master's women's classes, almost every woman, as you go down the line, you can see has been to some degree touched by that stick. Yeah? This is a conversation that you have to wait 10 years before you see the outcome. It doesn't happen in three months. It doesn't happen in six months. It's a very gradual build-up process that eventually women that have been in this sport for a very long time do exhibit signs of masculinization and virilization. And how we address that is not say don't do it. It's simply saying that's a consequence of leading with anabolic steroids with women, whereas what we need to lead with is anything else but androgens. And again, this is such a profound and radical shift in the way that we think. You have to understand coaches are going to be reluctant to share that with their clients because what they're going to be saying is, listen, Angie, uh, I know what I've been teaching you for two years is two years, but we need to change that because I fucked that up and I was wrong. The the, the reluctance to do that is profound. You know I mean? But again, this is where you're so different and people are, are looking at results straight away and they're not even looking about what it's going to do in one year let alone 10 years i agree so again you're proving that point so you're looking to the future and and you need to know what result what factually what's exactly going to happen to what you're putting in your body okay people just don't give that information out or they just don't know no also a lot of athletes will move to someone who will give them them no i I guess that I guess that's what I was saying before, Daniel, is I'm not just blaming coaches. I'm saying there are these silos and everyone is culpable. Everybody's culpable. Mm. So it's it's a very it's been a very long road for me because I've literally had to take on everybody, the forum owners, the coaches, the athletes, the doctors, the 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 YouTubers. It's been very difficult. Slowly, 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 we're starting to make your know, head ground where what I would argue is a significant number of people, once they hear that argument about women, they go, you know, that's really interesting. So with women, we don't need to focus on organ health so much as we need to hyper-focus on virilization. You know, yeah. Once you get that they're message, it changes your mindset. They're not walking around 300-pound of muscle either, are they? oh. They're not shoveling the kind of food and all the Correct. things that the guys are doing at a high it's, level. It's, it's a different discussion. 
I don't I don't want to be single in 10 years time because all the women will have mustaches and massive clits. So <laughs> I'm, really not, I'm not looking forward to that. <laughs> the only the way this day and age is going, that'll be normal for everybody. There's no such thing as a male or a female. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not gonna happen. I'll live in Thailand. <laughs> 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 oh, right. there was a couple of questions, Dan. You had a couple you wanted to ask, didn't you? Do you want to go down a couple of those? Well, like I mean, mine was more kind of because I've been just stuffing some kind of more holistic things and stuff like that, and addressing kind of social aspects of of it. And you know, you talked about culpability and stuff like that, and so I've been trying to not get too specific. Um, but the um, the thing, and you did touch about it a little bit, is like you talking about people making statements and the thing about social media and stuff that people don't like, they put so much stuff out that actually comes without a thought. And obviously people, even just in normal life, are ch you can see it on Facebook, like fuck Darren, my baby dad's a cock, not thinking that in 10 years, like your baby will see them see, you know, these things are documented, you know, and it's okay to get shit wrong, right? So, you know, say you make some statements and stuff like that, because you know, education in this has taken a huge uprising recently and people have made mistakes. I've made mistakes with myself and like it has, you know, it, it has happened. What would you like to see from people that have made mistakes? The, the, the challenge is not only is it okay to mistake, make mistakes, you need to be willing to change your opinion when you're presented with new evidence. You're right? So anyone that 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 says, "Look, I have this fixed framework, and that's the framework, and I'm gonna I'm gonna live and die by that framework," is not evidence based. As, as new information comes to light, as you meet other influential individuals, as you read new clinical literature, as you work with more clients, your opinions and beliefs should be shaped by that process. It's an expectation that you change your opinion as your career progresses. Mm -hmm. This is an expectation. But what that requires then is a culture of explaining when you get things wrong to people. Hey, I got this wrong. I'm correcting this information. You understand? I, I don't know whether you agree with me, but we, we don't live in that culture in our tribe. People don't apologize. People don't say I got things wrong. People don't correct things. People don't say that. It's literally statement, statement, statement. And then they just move on to the next statement, as you correctly said. It's I'm just asking. Ego. They, they, won't, it's, they can't it's, back down. It's ego and it's money. I mean, nothing better than I, I, I basically destroyed the Nandalone only tribe. And, and what they've now done is they've created this model called New Age Nandrolone, which is basically, so now they take exogenous estrogen with the Nandrolone, right? Because they were smart enough to understand the benefits of estrogen we talked before. It's a hypertrophic pathway. It's protective. So they go, yeah, you know, that's right, that's right. But rather than say, hey, listen, I fucked that up. We should, we should be using a testosterone base. They, they're smart enough to grab part of the story. And so now you have this Nandrolone plus estrogen pill model mm -hmm. that's going around. And that's driven by my destroying the Angelone, Nandrolone only model. You need estrogen, you need DHT. These things do stuff, right? But rather than admit they got it wrong and say, hey, listen, listen, we reflect on this. We've got new information. We're moving on. Their, their arrogance and their egos and and their financial position doesn't allow them to do that, so they 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 make it they make a shift and move forward. This is just how it is in our tribe. Mm -hmm. You look at the Psalms community. I don't know whether you understand. I explained to people the folly of men using Psalms. It's absolutely ridiculous when you understand what Psalms are. But you know the the Psalm sellers continue to sell Psalms. Mm -hmm. you, you do mean? you find it amusing? Does anyone really know what Psalms are? Yeah, I can tell you exactly what it, Psalms are. People, but, but is is there enough? Has it been around long enough to even? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So you have to understand that anabolic steroids are effectively steroidal Psalms. Yeah. So the reason that they're developing Psalms is because when we give anabolic steroids to women, we haven't, we never managed to remove the very last vestige of androgenic potential from drugs like Prima Bolin and Anavar. It's still there. Yeah. So it does make sense if you're going to give this class of drugs to women that maybe we can come up with a, a different steroidal system, a, 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 a skeletal system different to testosterone that carries the anabolic properties of testosterone, but completely removes the androgen potential. It does make sense. And that's what they're trying to do for clinical application. But you have to understand a couple of things. 
One is they're trying to solve a problem for women. Psalms in men is a problem that is looking for, a, uh, sorry, is a solution looking for a problem. What do you have to fear from prima bolin? You know, Psalms yeah. doesn't solve any of the problems of Anavar for men. It solves some of the problems for women. So if you're a woman, you should be very, very interested in what's coming down the Psalms pipeline. It's going to change everything for women. Men, there's nothing there for you. And then is the, it there yet? Are they there yet? Yeah, what, so, what, so what I would argue is that Osterine, right, which is the most studied drug, is really so close to human approval that we can consider it, for all intents and purposes, a viable candidate for discussion. So if you look down at the Psalms list, there's some that are better, like YK11, I don't know whether you know this, this drug, you know, YK11 has like four studies done on it. It's so far away from having a credible argument about you know, efficacy and, and safety that is ridiculous. Whereas Osterine is very, very close. And in my opinion, we'll see it approved within the next 18 months or so. I don't need a drug to actually have passed human approval as long as it's still being evaluated and as long as it hasn't been abandoned. And as long as the clinical literature coming out is continually supportive, it, it retains my interest. The primary point being though, is if you're a woman, you should be very interested in Psalms. If you're a man, there's nothing there for you. And the final caveat to that is understanding that we're supposed to give Psalms in such small doses that it does not suppress the HPTA. And if you if you bump in the dosages up that much to get any kind of muscle gain, then I There's, guess you're getting the side effects. Absolutely. To, so not so not only are you suppressing the HPTA, but you're introducing liver toxicity and lipid skewing and all of the problems that come with anabolic steroids. So it is literally a case of I'm explaining the, the sheer folly of men using this class of drugs. And rather than the SARM cells stopping that behavior and going, oh fuck, I got that wrong, they just plow on because they're making good coin. So, so to get any kind of muscle gain similar to steroids, the steroids are a lot safer to use than the Psalms. Hundred percent. If, if you if you hold anabolic steroids that are in, approved for clinical use against yeah. Psalms, anabolic steroids have a far, far, far better safety profile, more efficacious, and a better safety profile without question. It's no, it's, it's a no brainer. This is the problem I'm seeing with all the Psalms adverts and the way they push it out there and they advertise it by saying you'll get basically the benefits of steroids without yeah. any side effects. Great. And you see guys saying, I use Psalms and I put on two stone of muscle in so-and-so time. I used it alongside 600 milligram of testosterone. Great. Nobody it's about, it's, a, it's about just Psalms and got great muscle gains. It's, it's about them getting paid though. That's what yes. it's about. Now, here's the thing. It's very easy for us in our little tribe and our little you know, towers of bodybuilding to look at the Psalms community and say they're exhibiting that behavior. It's about them getting paid. What I'm suggesting is, but we do that shit as well. It's about getting paid very often. It's not about the right thing to do. This is why I'm poor. Yeah. I'm stupid. <laughs> do you know how much money I could make if I sold, like if I opened an under, I live in Thailand for fuck's sake. I could open an underground <laughs> lab and start selling drugs tomorrow. I would make millions because I have a brand doing like, but that's not what I do. That's not who I am. That's not what I stand for. But if I was interested in just money, I would be a fool. I mean, I live in Thailand. Why would I not start selling drugs? Like you're in, it's, it's, that's how, how anyone that wanted to, leverage my brand into wealth would do i would start the black labs and just go from there say so i would continue to pass out this message and i would you know recommend these drugs are these are safer yeah. than those drugs you know but well, i don't then you, you're having that, these conversations saying it's a lot safer to do much lower dosages correct. and then behind the scenes you'd be pushing out buy these steroids <laughs> <laughs> it kind of goes against your morals and it's, 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 not, it's, not, it's not what i stand for but the, the the sole point i was making here is you understand it's very easy for us to look at psalm sellers and point the finger and everyone goes yeah 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 you're right but when it comes to pointing the finger eternally people are uncomfortable with it but we're not different we're no different we're, we do a lot of things we do we do because we want to get paid yeah, yeah. and I, I just i'm a Obviously, myself, I'm against all of that. And I just think it's disgusting when you're lying to people's face just to take their money. And I guess that's what 90% of the industry is all about. It's always been about that, though. Yeah. Mm. It's not, you, you understand what I'm saying? I, I say things that upset people, but I'm saying 
if I was around in Ben Weeder's day, I would be choking out Joe Weeder. You, you understand what I mean? Like he's a freaking marketer that made up, just made shit up. Mm-hmm. During, I don't know whether you've seen the like the the leather and lead bracelets and like you got to be a real man to wear them and stuff. The stuff he sold was outrageous. <laughs> so you know, like people complain today because I'm picking on this guy that day. I'm telling you, if I was doing this and I was doing this in the '70s, I would be choking out Joe Weeder. Yeah. I'm choking out the behavior, not the individual. Yeah. So we get one. I'm going to ask one question from our viewers because there was a couple of questions, but one. Great. So the, the one question I'm going to ask is from Naked Smooth, I like the name. Good name, um, yep. Yeah, so uh, what does Victor think on subcutaneous versus, versus intramuscular pinning for anabolic steroids? I'm a huge fan. Yeah? Yeah. So let me just explain why. I would argue that you need to master both administration technique for intramuscular and subcutaneous administration if you're going to be using these drugs for a lifetime. Why? Because there's a time and a place to do both. If you're using relatively small doses of these drugs and you have a reasonable body composition level, and what I mean by that is you know, walk around levels, then subcutaneous provides a very flat delivery profile with the lowest side effects. You know, we have, again, clinical literature to support this, the lowest rate of estrogen conversion, the lowest hematocrit production, da, 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 comes from high frequency subcutaneous administration. But it's not always practical to do that, especially if, one, you raise the volume because the volume of subcutaneous administration clinical breast practice says half a cc a day or half a cc an admin point, I should say. Yeah. So if you're going to be using 1,500 milligrams a week, how? You understand how? But if you're using, say, 500, 600 milligrams a week, then it is a practical discussion from a volume administration point of view. Yeah. And also, you know, when you get down to very body, low body fat levels and you don't have subcutaneous fat to administer in, sometimes that can be problematic. So you need to, in my opinion, be able to do both. But having more real estate to deliver these drugs in over a lifetime, hopefully just has obvious benefits. You distribute the drugs, you create less scar tissue, you have less burden of administration, as it were. I'll give you a classic example. You, you know the drug uh, uh, injectable or carnitine? I'm quite a big fan of injectable carnitine. The one problem with it is the burden of administration. If you buy this in, you know, one cc is 200 milligrams and you want to take 200 milligrams a day, you need to inject a cc a day. That's a burden. You understand? So administering the drugs is a conversation about a number of things from the pharmacokinetics profile of the drug all the way to the burden of injecting. And what I would argue is you, you should you should learn to do both and know when when to lean into one or the other. I certainly do both, yeah. I mean, if you was injecting larger quantities and doing it under the skin, is that not opening you up for more uh, infections or yeah, is it yes, that, for that to disperse? That, that's what I was suggesting. So clinical breast practice, understanding that subcutaneous administration of these drugs is a medical practice, but as a general rule of thumb, they say uh, uh, the maximum that you should administer is a half a cc. Okay. Yeah. So if we said, right, your testosterone and your other anabolics are at two, 200 milligrams per cc, right? That means the most you get to put in is 100 milligrams a day. That's 700 milligrams a week you're tapped out. You, you understand? So you can effectively operate at that dosage volume and down subcutaneously but if you're going to go more than 700 milligrams a week then either you're doing multiple shots or you just move to intramuscular yes you don't want to put large oil deposits under the skin yeah yeah so listen i know obviously with the we've been on for a while now so what we like yeah. to uh coming towards the end i'm assuming the guys don't have anything burning that they want to ask before we jump into the top tips i could talk all day but <laughs> i know i know can i can i make this suggestion guys what, what i would like to suggest is this i enjoy these opportunities to disseminate information very much i think they're very valuable yeah how about let's just put it out there and if people hate me, great. And if people you know, want me to come back and talk about more, I'm I'm happy to come back and we can oh, talk again at another time. You know? yes, so great. let's just see what people say. People maybe people don't want to hear anymore. People do if they do, and and if they do, maybe they can ask some specific questions like Mr. Blue Smurf did, and we can roll through them. Well, listen. Mm. If they don't, then I, I quit. 
So, um, <laughs> if, they, if they know they can fuck up with, because I'm interested, I'm learning a lot today, and I'm really enjoying this. this yeah. Good. Cool. So so that's yeah. why I wanted to get to have you. Victor on, because, because, because a lot of people know the people that Victor's going through, that the, the effects those models are having, and a lot of people know these people very well. So we wanted to, although we don't have a large audience, I wanted to show where it's from to people and hopefully for those who don't know will know and then tell someone else and more people will one, know. one one mind at a time that's all i'll tell I, <laughs> I, I, maybe i could put a plea out i, I explain this i've said this many many times john jewett has done more for this than any other man on the planet simply because of his profile you yeah. understand so he does two things one is he, he knows what he's talking about he's an awfully nice guy he's far nicer than i am and <laughs> he he willingly accepts what 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 i have shared with him so he's like that all i really want all we really need is another four or five john jewett's and we're done yeah you understand what i mean like we don't need more than that we just need to have a half a dozen i mean i'll give you a classic example i call people like this one. why can't i get on fuad abiyad show what why with everything i'm doing can i get not get a seat why can i not get on dave palumbo's show why it's a fair question. Why can I not get a seat? I think I've earned you a seat. You me on that. Come on, yeah. you can get on there. <laughs> I, but but here, here's the challenge, and that is that all we really need is three or four more John Dewitts, people that are high profile, people respect, that, that are articulate, that know what they're talking about, and uh, that are carrying the models forward. And this is going to accelerate. Just whoo, it'll take off. You know? At the moment, what we're battling is a lot of people kind of nodding, going, "Yeah, the guy's right," but they don't they don't want to speak up because it means they have to say what I said yesterday. I was wrong. Speak, yeah. Speaking at face value, having had this time on this call with you, um, from what I can interpret is is that there's just a lot of people getting their backs up because you are right, and there's a lot of people mm -hmm. who are putting out the information out there, like you said. And they don't want to have to backtrack. Um, there's a lot of people who will personally take offense when it's not necessarily aimed at them, but if the cap fits and all that, they're gonna start to end up, you know, getting offended by the things that you're putting out there. So I guess the the whole controversy that comes from you sharing this information is kind of their problem and not yours, really. Well, you, you let's go back to that blue smurf question. I'm assuming that guy's asking the question for a reason. Yeah. Now. I've heard lots of things that say things like subcutaneous administration is less efficacious. I don't know whether that was driving the discussion or not, but it's something that people say. Yeah. But we have dozens of pharmacokinetic studies on the subcutaneous administration of testosterone and nandrolone showing is there's no loss of efficacy. It doesn't magically disappear during, it doesn't go into fat cells and become inert. Yes, it's fair to say that when you administer subcutaneously, then the delivery profile is a flatter profile, right? It acts much the same the way as a long-acting ester would. Does that make sense? So you get a, a flatter delivery profile. But once you build that up over time, over a week or a, a month, you get to a, a solid state. I'm assuming he's asking because he's heard the bro science of that's not as effective as intramuscular administration. But the point I'm making is don't take my word for it. I want to show you the dozen pharmacokinetic studies that we have on individuals, the studies they did on subcutaneous injector pens and all sorts of clinical literature that says there's no difference. And then we use the logic that says, so if it's different, where does it go? Where do you think it, well, like, well, you think it just evaporates? Like it, it, it go, if you said to me, yeah, but it takes a week longer to come out the other end, if that makes sense. I know that's a very bro thing to say, right? Yeah, yeah you're right. It does. If you inject... It into, a week longer to get in. Good. So if you inject into your delts or you inject subcutaneously, the profile of delivery will be flatter in subcutaneous because it has to work its way out of the fat tissue and into the bloodstream. And this is a, this is a more direct pathway than, say, into a, an area. Where that That's true, but... The drugs don't disappear. They're kind of trickling it in. So it, it, it's similar to eating simple carbs compared to complex carbs, the way your body would break it down and get into your system. And, and what I would argue from a safety profile, a nice flat hormonal profile is what we seek. We don't want peaks and troughs. Why don't you still, I mean, if you want it fast, why don't you do it interven intravenously? Yes. That's what I want to say. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's do that. <laughs>
Cool. That's nice. Awesome. All right. Um, I think the reason that a lot of people have their, their their backups is that they're taking it like, I must adopt all of this. And what you're saying is like, hey, check it out. Have a think about it. Dude, I want I want people to tell the world what's what 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 I'm wrong about. Tell me what I'm wrong about. I I actively encourage people to refute what I'm saying. No, he's wrong, and here's the clinical literature. That's what I want. The, the, the reason I'm so Dave, confident, Victor, the difficulty I think a lot of people is taking that as arrogance. Just not. You're actually genuinely want they gen, you genuinely want them to do it, and that's the difference. That's not arrogance. That's I, 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 I'm, I, I, what people don't understand about me is I only argue what can't be argued. Yeah, yeah. I have a list of 101 things that I think I think I know I don't talk about because I think I think I know. Does it make sense? And gradually, as my confidence on those subjects grows, I release one new thought at a time. But when I talk to you and I say to you, listen, there's no, it's almost impossible for you to justify the use of veterinary drugs, that you can do everything you need to do with a proof for human use drugs. You're going to fucking lose. You understand? You're going to lose. When I say to you, elevated androgen levels are plausibly deleterious to your cognitive health, you're going to lose. They are. We, we're beyond maybe. We're into, yeah, they are. Now we need a plan to mitigate that. You've really opened my mind about that. And I myself is going to go into research and a lot more of the effects of steroids on, on to brain health. Because well, that's really interesting. Everyone can join Victor's site. All, all I would suggest they do is because they're watching this podcast is I have my own podcast where I have experts on. Usually they tend to be people that I need to lean on academically. They're not bodybuilders. I tend to, you know, talk to PhDs and, you know, and, and, and medical doctors and things like that. Just go and watch 20 hours of free content. And if I haven't convinced you by the time I get to 20 hours of free content, then, then fair call. I just want you to Are hear you the sure argument. sure you're ready to pause that? because i did a lot of pausing i was like what the fuck hold on uh, okay of google is heavy it's heavy i like that right well listen um if we're gonna do a part two then I, i'll hold off on the five top tips which is what we would normally do at the end of a podcast um but we could do this let's do those do you guys have yeah. time do you yeah, have time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So, so five top tips for what? So it's just uh, it anything, life. Anything. Yeah, yeah. It's like shooting at the hip. So if you were to give five tips to to, so we've got mostly you know sort of gym bros, bodybuilders, competitors, coaches watching this, um, UK bodybuilding scene mostly. So if you were to consider it along those lines, if you were going to give five tips to anyone off the top of your head, what would they be? I, I would I would say the first thing is you should listen to many voices. Yeah. But, you, you know, it, when you're trying to learn something, this is how I learn about drugs, you start off listening to 20 people and what you do is you clip off the extremes of things. And I, I think this applies equally to learning anything. Start off listening to 20 people. Don't become, you know, focused on one person's dogma. Don't, don't have a guru, yeah? But be willing to listen to people that have different points of view. That I mean, debate to me is how you learn. This guy said that, and this guy counted. This guy said this guy, and they counted. You know, you don't want to lean into one one story that you know they. It's kind of like what I call the circle jerk. They all agree with each other, and you they can you can get led astray. There. So I said I would say the big one would be li listen to many voices, but you need to be willing to trim that down over time, so you end up with three or four people that become your go to. And I think that applies to everything in bodybuilding. The second thing is this. This is a really profound. Uh, I'm sorry. This, it's supposed to be quick. I used to get incredibly frustrated because I would ask 10 people a question. I would get 10 different answers and it really fucking annoyed me. You know, like, how is this possible? Like these are 10 expert people. And every time I ask them, I get a different answer. Have you guys experienced that in this mm -hmm. thing? Okay. What it took me a long time to figure out was that that meant that that question was for all intents and purposes, meaningless, a simple example if you were talking about wealth creation or entrepreneurship and you spoke to successful entrepreneurs, almost all the time, they'll say to you, you need to run your own show. You can't be a salaried employee. It needs to be your gig. You know, that's like 99% of, of successful people would agree with that. Yeah. But when you ask them what business you should go in, you'll hear everything from food to real estate, to investment, to whatever. So the point I'm making is 
it's really important you run your own show, but you can make money in any industry. Does that make sense? Yeah. And in bodybuilding, very often we ask questions and we hear get 10 different answers. All that means is, well, that doesn't fucking matter very much. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Because if you ask people, at, is adherence important? No one says it's negotiable. It's fucking not negotiable. You have to turn up and do. You know I mean? But then you'll hear 10 guys arguing about shit and I go, well, clearly that means that that doesn't matter very much. Yeah. And I learned you know, probably too late that you know, and when you get 10 different opinions, put it aside and don't worry about it too much because it literally means it doesn't fucking matter. Not like that. You know? And, and you know, and, uh, what's that? That's two. <laughs> yeah, two. <laughs> so two. So yeah, I, I, can, I can go through a whole bunch of things, but let, let me just talk something quickly about drugs. What I would argue is this, and that is, I would argue that in our community, in our tribe, that most of the people that create educational content are really not here to educate the tribe. They're here to make money. They're looking to sell a book. They're looking to get YouTube views. They're looking to do, to do something right with money. Yeah. So I'm not saying don't listen to people's content. I'm saying listen with a critical ear. Listen to people and then go, does that make sense? Listen to people and, and does it make sense? And you have to, and, and and very quickly what you'll realize is, I don't know whether you agree with me, but guys like Derek Cole from More Plates, More Dates, he has a million point five followers and he creates evidence-based. You have to understand who the guy is. That guy is a modern day Joe Weider. He's a marketing specialist who happens to be extremely good at marketing. That's what his degree is, and if anyone doesn't know, right? And he knows exactly what he's doing and, and kudos to him as a business person but if you understand his history and you understand who it is, he's not there to educate the tribe. He's there to drive significant revenues into his bank account, which is completely fair. And if you understand that, then that might color your thinking about who you shouldn't who you shouldn't listen to. I don't think people understand that many voices in our tribe are driven by uh, motivation to to acquire wealth, as opposed. To, to, to the desire to disseminate information. I'll give a couple of voices if I can to listen to, yeah? So if you guys aren't listening today, guys like Dr. Scott Stevenson, you need to follow this guy. We had him on. We've had him on. Yeah. Like, how the, on. how the fuck does that guy have 30,000 followers on Instagram? I do not understand. Me, yeah. I'm an arsehole. I'm controversial. I upset everyone. He's the world's nicest guy, and, and yeah. everything he says is considered and thoughtful. Yeah. We're polar opposites in terms of personality, right? And yet he can't seem to get the traction that he deserves, right? Because he's not terribly, if I'm honest, he's not terribly good at marketing himself. He's a, a, an outstanding educator and not a great marketer. And that's the point. Of so you have Dr. Scott Stevenson and fucking more plates, more dates. What the fuck are you even listening to this guy for? Listen yeah. to Scott. Yeah. 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 So we can go through some other names, but Scott Stevenson is one. If you guys don't know, I sometimes piss off Dr. Dean St. Mark, but he, he we've had, has we've had him on as well. <laughs> he's a credible well. voice. You need to listen to what this guy has to say. He doesn't agree with everything I have to say. And I annoy him and he blocked me on Instagram, but I don't fucking <laughs> care. Right. The point is, I think you should listen to what he has to say yeah, yeah. and then contrast what he's saying against what I'm saying. If that makes sense. So, if you don't know Dr. Eric Helms, do you guys know who he is? We haven't More, had that one on. No. You should get him on. He's he's a natural guy. He doesn't take on enhanced athletes, and he's from that domain. Dr. Brad Schoenfeld, you know Brad yeah. Schoenfeld, yeah. So there's a whole list of names you should follow. But what you will quickly understand is the people I follow have twenty thousand followers on Instagram, not a million. Yeah. Mm. I don't really give my time to people that are mainstream marketing voices because I understand that that's why they're popular. They happen to be very good at marketing. And if you look at what I consider to be the top six PED educators in the world, collectively together, we can't rustle up 100,000 followers. The problem is, though, Victor, if you went on one of these mainstream channels, you'd steal the show. That's the problem. <laughs> the, the reason that I, the reason that I won't be invited on, I'm just very honest, is because they have panels of experts that regularly come on, right? That have established credibility and presence. And me coming along and saying all you dudes are wrong, I mean, like it's it's a tough message to sell, right? Mm -hmm. But a, what I always argue is, but you have to understand, a true journalist doesn't shy away from interviewing controversial figures. It's not journalism you're listening to, it's marketing. 
doing. A true journalist would go, oh, fucking, let's get Dean St. Martin, Victor on, and have him fucking have it out on the fucking show. Let's do it. Like, you know, <laughs> this, this, but this is, this is what should be happening. The, the, you know, like you have to understand Dave Palumbo's show is, with all due respect, is a very successful marketing platform for his supplement company. Right, me going on there and telling him that his panel of experts don't really understand performance enhancing drugs st- doesn't serve them because they effectively lose credibility in the eyes of their audience. Yeah, why would he ever ask me to come on? It's ridiculous. It'd be, it'd be funny though. It'd be hilarious, but it wouldn't. <laughs> it, it, it wouldn't. It wouldn't raise their stock. No, definitely not. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, Palumbo's had some questionable guests. Over the, over the yeah, he's the, he's the, but he's the classic guy. It's like you take a break because the androgen receptors need to be refreshed. This is something he says over and over and over again. This is just fucking made up. Mm. This is it's just fucking made up. Yeah, it's like it's like uh, Dave Palumbo giving waist training advice. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the the, the the opportunity to come back would be much appreciated, guys. Let's put it out there. there. If 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 guys want to, we can just kind of break down in different segments maybe we can drill a, little yeah, we'll try to do a bit more structured next yeah time. i mean i think this is for, for for our first call is very interesting because it's probably going to be a lot of people that are hearing some of this for the first time and they go well that was interesting and now i want to know more maybe we can do a female show maybe we can do a competitive show maybe we can do an anti-aging show whatever i'm i'm I, i'm open to to any opportunity to help educate the tribe. I'd love to do a female Let's, let's get you and Dr. David Sinclair on. Yeah, we'll try and get <laughs> a charity fight match. <laughs> yeah, I think no, he's, a, he's, he's, he's a great guy. We, we, we differ. i tell you why we differ, just so it's so clear. Dean is a very competent and very capable academic. Yeah. But I would argue that that's what I said right at the beginning. That's one piece of the discussion. Just because you have a PhD doesn't mean you're right. Mm. You know, I'm interested in what you have to say, but that doesn't mean you're right. You know, mm. Because someone over here that's had 40 years of bodybuilding experience, I, w- I want to hear both voices so I can make a decision after hearing both voices. Mm. You know, academics how, don't... How many, how many facts that are written in books have been proven wrong down the line? It's my old point. When you're taught something, you only know what you've been taught. Who's to say what was right in the first place? This is this is one of the things always being proven wrong. This is one of the things that I don't think people understand about academia, though, and that is, do you know who Jordan Peterson is? Yeah, Mm -hmm. he's a very controversial figure. Love him or hate him, it doesn't matter. But you understand that who he debates are PhDs, and they argue all the time. Just because you have a PhD doesn't mean you're right about anything. It means that you can probably articulate a point of view very clearly, and then you get another point of view and you oppose them, and then you make a decision based after you hear both points. All you need to do is follow some of Jordan Peterson's material and understand that he literally spends most of his time arguing academics you know, with completely opposing points of view. And I think one of the things that academics don't do well with is understanding that, like, bros can argue against academics. It doesn't go down well. <laughs> yeah. no, and also, with a, lot, with a lot of these people that claim to be, like, researching and stuff, is actually they don't have the tools to research. They don't understand what it means. Um, and also, like, one, you know, one, a singular trial or, or a paper is not absolute. It means nothing. It's 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 it's, so it's, it's one, but people think, oh, I read this paper; it's a hundred percent fact. Mm. And I'm from a fairly like, I didn't do um, I did a master's in education actually, but they have the ability to decipher information. Like it is a useful tool. And a lot of people are just picking one thing on, quoting it, and being like, "Science, the end." I'll, I'll give you a, a, a simple closing statement: that testosterone, growth hormone, and insulin are three of probably the most studied drugs in all pharmacology yeah i mean like there's collectively 50 or 60 or 70 thousand studies you know i don't think any one individual could sit down and read every study there was to read on those three drugs alone and just end it there during you know? <laughs> we're, we're all 
you know, biased. We all have our own filters. We all have our limitations on time. We all gravitate towards certain types of studies, whether it be a meta analysis or whether it be something that was bodybuilding specific. So the idea that you can take one study and and make a takeaway that you can apply universally to bodybuilding or powerlifting is that's just not how it works. You look at the information in the clinical literature. You say based on that, this is what I think it's saying, and then I take that that framework and I look at the real world, you know, what's happening in the gym, what's happening in the wild and say, so how, how do these two things to relate to each other? And then ultimately, you know, and I, I go to my client and I say, do you have a personal choice here? Do you have a personal preference for this here? Cause we've got a couple of doorways here. If you, if you, you know, hear my argument about ARBs and hematocrit and, and Jonathan, you still want to do phlebotomy, then do phlebotomy. I'm not your mother. You understand? It's really, really simple to me. Yeah, but it's also really simple to me that it, you've provided an argument enough that it all the logic in my mind is is, mm. is now leading me down a different path. You yep. know, when in, okay. in, in, in my my opinion previously was based on regurgitated information and and advice that I was given that kind of made sense uh, yep. in a in a roundabout bro science way. But then when you've kind of laid it in the way that you did. You know, it, it just makes no sense to me that people could even argue a lot of these topics because, mm. uh, you know, it, it's the facts. You can't argue mm. argue against facts, you know? I agree. I agree. A thing we've all done it, and is a perfect example. I, I've regurgitated the thinking that when you have time off gear, it, it really, your receptor sites become yeah. more active. When you've just there, you, I, I can't back Everyone that was told that. Me. Everyone was told that. Yeah, yeah. and, okay. and you, just, you just kind of, because so many people say it, you kind of just believe, okay, that's how it is. But mm. I've never read a paper or studied, looked up into that scientifically, if that's actually factual or not. Can I, can I, can I, can I do this just as a, a, as, a, as a segue? When you post this, I'd like to give you guys a link to a, a gentleman called Dr. Scott Howe, PhD, he has a PhD in androgen toxicity. He has a video specifically on that subject. It's just Brilliant. the androgen receptors. And then people that are, are, are reading this or watching this can can then follow on with that video. It's it's a uh, it's a guest on one of my and you know it's a segue into the next thread. You're in. Let's yeah, go. Yeah. Let's do that. And then I have to do a video and, and every single person I've ever said that to, I'm gonna to have to say, look, I'm really <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Open my mind. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what the fuck is it? It's pretty wrong. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. I'll I'll give you guys that link before you post up. Yeah. Perfect. Right. Okay. Well, listen. We'll get this up, and I'll send you the link to it, Victor. And uh, we'll we'll suss out a bit more of a structure for a part two. I know Dan was keen on doing like a female based one because again, that's one that's ultimately in the UK. There are a couple of people who you have been locking horns with who are leading the way on that subject. Um, so I think that would be one that would be received particularly well as well. Um, okay. But like just as a, a final note, really, I just really want to appreciate that you've given your time to us, really, because I've learned yeah, more in the last two hours from you than I have in the last 10 years. So it's, uh, I'm probably going to have to watch this back to try and absorb a bit more of it. 